The challenge of the Yukon. King, the swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. (laughs) Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region and the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. It was early afternoon, and Sergeant Preston was on patrol duty in the Yukon with his lead dog, the Great King. The snow was swept clean from much of the land, and Preston had left his sled and team in town. What is it, King? All right, King, you lead the way. He's going after something, but I can't make out what it is. He's following a scent. It'll be a good idea to see what it leads to. All right, boy, I'm coming. Yes, I see, King. Footprints, huh? Oh, that's strange. Snow's partially covered those tracks. It's worth investigating. Hmm, the wind swept this land clean. The tracks stop. King, old fellow, you'll have to lead from here on. That cave over there? Is that where you're going, King? Well, King, you've never been wrong before. Whatever's in that cave must be pretty important. Uh, This is one place we've missed on our patrols, King. Hmm. Here's some wood. Someone uses this cave. What for? Look at these pelts. Fox, lynx, beaver... Why, they're beautiful. Trapper uses this cave for a storeroom. has certainly got a fortune in fur. One man couldn't have... Well, this cave is full of pills. Yes, King? What's over there now? Oh, I see. So this is what had you so excited, boy. Now, what would any trapper with these rich skins be doing with dog and wolf pelts? They have no value. I can understand a trapper building up a supply of high-grade pelts, but why would he keep so many of these worthless ones? What is it, boy? Huh? Someone coming? Yes, King. There's something wrong here. We can't get out without being discovered. We'll get back at the far end of the cave. Ah, here. We should be safe here. Now, play dead, King. Play dead, boy. Another bunch will catch you now. <clears throat> uh, that's the last of them, thank heaven. I'm so tired of hauling these pelts. The hound's I... almost over now. You take one more load of dog and wolf skins to the storehouse, and then the whole thing can go up in smoke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and those trappers, they'll take it mighty hard. It's a good thing you made them sign those contracts. Our agreements will make us rich. We don't pay, though a shipment is made. <laughs> that contract was the smartest thing you ever put together, Vance. I'm jack of all trades, and a pace to know a little about them all. I didn't have much to do with any law, but I can draw up a watertight contract, and there's not a thing any of those trappers can do to break their agreements. Just look at that beaver skin. It's a beauty. Yeah, it's a beauty, all right. We're sitting mighty pretty. Look at those fox pelts. Uh, these skins will bring a fortune. Yep. Yeah. What do you have a gold mine in the fur business? All them trappers need is to hear the prices we pay for the skins, and they're bringing the best ones to us in carloads. The best part of it is we pay when shipment's made, <laughs> and we never ship. Yeah, we can't tote these wolf and dog skins to the warehouse till dark, Vance. No, we might as well stay right here till sundown. Yeah, I'll start a fire. Wait a minute. 
Leave that firewood alone. Let me listen. What's eating you, Vance? There's someone in this cave. Oh, who could be? There's in? someone in here, I tell you. Listen, Vance, there ain't a soul knows about this cave. Well, we can look around just to make sure if it'll make you feel any better. It's no joke, Duval. I know there's someone in here. You got a sixth sense, Vance. You go along that wall. I'll take this time. Well, there's so many parts of this cave. We can look all night and still not be anywhere. Shut up. I don't know what's got into you lately, Vance. You was never so edgy before. Come out with your hands up. It'll go a lot easier with you. I ain't gonna walk into our arms, Vance. If there is somebody in here, you know that. And we'll search this cave till we find him. Come on. I don't know where he gets these ideas. Someone in the cave. He's taking this thing pretty seriously. That's a warning. Come out with your hands up. You shot loose in some rocks. Oh. Hey, what the... I told you there was somebody in here. Now bring that light over. I've got a gun and I'm going to use it. Maybe some of that rock hit him, Vance. Hurry up with that light. Jumping the horn towards a mountain. Well, I never expected to meet Sergeant Preston knocked out by a couple of falling rocks. Come on, Duval. We'll tie him up before he regains consciousness. Uh, here's some of that rope we used to tie the pelts together. That'll be all right. <laughs> if that mutt moves, shoot him. Oh. Yeah, that does it. You had a hard time getting free of these ropes. Oh, my head. Oh, I must have... Shut up, you mutt. King, old fellow. We've got to do something about this mountain, Vance. You heard us talking. Don't worry. We'll take care of him. Oh. Shoot that mutt, Duval. Quiet, King. Call him out here. All right, King. Come on out, boy. Shoot him, Duval. Oh, now, Vance. You heard me. Are you going to shoot him or will I? Make a break for King. Go on, boy. Well, get him. No, you won't, Vance. You're not going to kill King. Go ahead. Shoot, Duval. I'll throw you, Vance. He's clean away. Uh, if you'd have shot him when I told you. King. Hey, King, is that the dog? Yeah, that... that's the smartest lead dog in the Yukon. And now he's going to bring help, thanks to you. Oh, we better get rid of this mouldy fast then, Vance. Sure. Fine. Have you got any ideas? Now put a couple of bullets in him right now. You should have thought of that when the dog was here. No, a suicide to kill a Marty. You'll never get away with this. Listen, Preston. This is one time you're not holding the gun. You'll die all right, but without bullet marks on you. You can't win, Vance. Sometime and soon, the inspector will send one of the other Marty's to see what's happened. Let him. By that time, Duval and me will be so far out of the Yukon, your law will never catch up with us. Now, don't worry. When you're a found prisoner, it's not going to look like murder. What do you aim to do with him, Vance? We'll gag him and take him for a walk. You mean... Yes. We'll have to go ahead with our plans tonight. We can't waste any time. That dog will have someone back here in a few hours. You're right. Let's pack up these furs and get moving. <laughs> Late that night, with heavy packs on their shoulders, Vance and Duval sneaked into Machiti and forced Preston at the point of a gun to go ahead of them. He'll go right to the warehouse. Yeah. The sooner we get there, the better. I don't like going through the town carrying this stuff. Don't worry, no one will stop us. I'm thinking about that dog. Once Preston's out of the way, our troubles are over. <laughs> of course, it'd be different if that mutt could talk. Here we are. I never was so glad to see any place in all my life. This Mounty was downright obedient. <laughs> Throw him down on top of some of those worthless pelts, then tie his feet. All right, Mounty. You won't be able to move when I finish tying this. <laughs> We'll put a lot of these dog skins around him. You figure he's... We want Sergeant Preston's death in the fire to look real. Or we want to be sure there's not a chance for him to get out alive. I get you, Vance. That way you can say he was caught trying to save someone from the burning warehouse, huh? Good idea. Now, someone in this outfit has got to get ideas. Come on, Duval. We'll put some of this oil around. <laughs> I ought to 
be enough, Vance. Yeah, that'll do it. Now I'll take this lamp. Oh, those skins burn plenty fast. This place will be an inferno in five minutes. Less than that. Come on, let's get out of here. I don't want to be too close to this place where the fire is discovered. Attracted first by the red glow of the flames against the darkness of the night, men poured from ramshackle buildings surrounding the warehouse and watched the fire. They knew the furs inside were lost. They knew that the cost of the damage would break many a trapper's heart. But they didn't know that inside the building, Sergeant Preston lay bound and gagged, helpless in the face of certain death. A tall, lanky trapper came from Mashiti City's cafe. The expression on his face told the story more eloquently than words. Hey, all my furs are in there. Yeah, look at them flames. I'm going in there. You're local. If you do, you'll never get out alive. My warehouse. We're ruined. Ain't a chance in the world of saving anything. Laval, if that building caves in, we haven't a chance. Yes, and it's going. My to. furs. Man, 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 listen to me. You better make good of them first, yeah. man. What are you going to do about it, Page? Boys, I'm sorry. What about us? Page, we won't lose everything, will we? What Wait about a minute. Well, listen to me. About it. You men all signed agreements with us. We agreed to pay when we shipped the furs. If the furs aren't shipped, we don't pay. You mean I've lost a whole year's trap in that fire and I get nothing to show for it? I'm sorry, Hankins, but there's not a thing we can do about it. We lost the warehouse. There goes the business. <laughs> Does it do well? Preston's covered with red hot embers by now. I gotta hand it to you, Vance. Well, Hankins, what was in that warehouse is just a hopeless loss now. You ought to give us at least a quarter of what our furs were worth, Vance. If we'd have taken them to Hudson Bay Company, we'd have. Well, he didn't take them to the Hudson Bay Company. Why do you suppose he pays such high prices? We got competition to meet. We meet it the best way we know how, that's with highest prices. We don't allow a cent for any losses. You don't have to take a loss, Hankins. Preston. No, no. Wait, I'm seeing things. Huh. How did that You're muddy? not saying things, Duval, but you soon will be. The inside of a jail. <laughs> that mutt, he must Yes, be. Vance, thanks to King here, I got out of that burning warehouse. He chewed through the ropes. Uh, what did you mean, Sergeant? You said I don't have to take no loss. I meant just what I said, Hankins. Your furs, together with the furs of the other trappers, are all safe in a cave about two miles from uh, here. Well, how big... Vance said... Vance you... and Duval are under arrest. You'll have to prove your story first, Monty. I'll prove it. Hankins, I'll take you to that cave where you'll find your furs. Well, it ain't no crime to put furs in the cave. And as for yourself, Monty, you can't Maybe prove... Maybe I can't prove you tried to kill me, Duval. You have no charge, Preston, and you know it. You can't prove we burned down our own warehouse. We didn't know the furs had been transferred to the cave. Someone else did it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. We didn't know nothing about it. You have agreements with these trappers to pay them high prices when you ship. You agreed to those high prices because you didn't expect to pay them. But we'll make sure you ship now, and the law will see you stand by every word of your agreement. Sergeant, that contract gives him 30 days to ship. Don't worry, Hankins. They'll ship in 30 days, all right. And you'll have your money. <laughs> yes, King, the case is closed. <laughs> Upholding the motto of the Northwest Mounted Police, Sergeant Preston and the great dog King maintain the right and get their man. Don't miss their next thrilling adventure when they meet the challenge of the Yukon once again on Saturday at 6.30. On King! On you husky! Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, brought to you every Saturday at this time, originated in the transcription studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bill Morgan speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> Husky! 
King, the swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region, and the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. <laughs> Driving, ceaseless snow made the vast Yukon a blurred mass of whiteness. But even the fury of the storm could not obscure the natural protection of a group of huge rocks that shut out the merciless winds. It was there the two men crouched, guns within easy reach, while they rubbed their hands together for warmth. You picked a fine day to do this job, Manny. I ain't seen weather like this since I come to the Yukon. Listen, Tom, you know the reason we're here. I can't help it if Jim Glenn always drives into Melville City on Wednesdays, can I? Rain, snow, or shine don't make no difference to him. It'll have to be a plenty rich haul to be worth freezing to death. Glenn's carrying the finest lot of furs this side of the Great Divide. I know that for a fact. Well, he's done his last bit of trapping. You see him coming yet, Manny? I can't see far beyond these rocks. He ought to be alone. You know, Tom, I don't like the idea of doing away with Glenn. Ain't no other way to get our hands on them furs, is there? No. Well, then. Murder's the one thing we ain't done, Tom. Only because we get what we wanted without it. The other robberies were easy. Yeah. Well, ain't he coming yet? Yeah. I think that's a sled along there. But it's too far away to be sure. Yeah, wait a minute. Let me see. Ever since you had that touch of snow blindness, you can't tell a man from a grizzly at 30 feet. Yeah. I think he's coming, Manny. Yeah. We'll wait till he's alongside of these rocks. Then we'll... And we'll open up on him, huh? That's the idea. Got your gun ready? Yeah. Well, we'll just wait now and surprise Mr. Glenn. He's making right good time. Yeah. He's got a good set of dogs. <laughs> what are you grinning at? Jim Glenn racing like that to the bullet. This ain't no time for jokes, Tom. Sometimes Take I... Take it easy, kid. Here he comes now. Get ready. Mush, you horrible! Mush! That did it. Come on, Tom. Let's get those furs and get out of here. Watch out for that lead dog there, Manny. He's loose. All right. But I want to get these furs on the wire sled. Look out, Manny. He's going to jump. Oh! Get down, you mutt. Oh, let go of my hand. Oh! Nice shot, Manny. Nice shot. That mutt tore my hand. Say, he sure got you. Hey, let me help you. I'll have to put a bandage of some kind on until we get to town. It'll be a while before you'll be able to do much with this hand, Manny. I'll take care of it when we get back to town. Come on, Tom. The snow covered tracks almost as soon as they were made. So Sergeant Preston, heading for Melville City had no way of knowing that he was trailing a murdered man. But as they neared the rocks, the great dog King sensed death in the air. What is it, King, huh? All right, fella, you lead the way. Oh, you huskies, ho, oh, boys. My King, there's nothing but snow. Nuzzling around this snow, won't you? King, there's a body here. So this is why you are... Why, it's Jim Glynn. He must have been... But why? Shot through the heart. And his dog. So they killed the dog, too. And no wonder you were excited, boy. He's following tracks over to those rocks. Well, now I begin to see... Tracks here haven't been covered by the snow. Sheltered by rocks. Those two men were standing here. They waited here until Jim Glynn was practically in front of them before they fired. Jim didn't have a chance. If they waited here, then they must have... Well, it's hard to tell which way they went. Well, King, what have you found now? Oh, 
all more tracks, huh? Yeah. Here's a bandana. C.N. Hmm. C.N. Now, who could... Newton. Cy Newton. He pulled in here about the same time the two other fellows were here. The tracks don't differ. They're about the same depth. King, we're going to Melville City to call on Cy at the Silver Lantern Cafe. Cy Newton sat at the table in a back room of the Silver Lantern Cafe, resting his head on his hands. In spite of the fact that it was early afternoon, the sun had already gone down. The glimmer of the dingy light thrown from the sputtering oil lamp showed where Cy's Mackinac lay in a corner of the room, wet with melted snow. Oh, Cy, I didn't know you were here. Hello, Manny. What's the matter? You look like you got something on your mind. I have. Well, what is it? Business is good, ain't it? What happened to your hand? Oh, one of them stray mutts bit me. I've got to fix the dressing. He sure tore into you. Yeah, I guess he belongs to one of the trappers out front. Ain't no use lying to me, Manny. <coughs> lying, do you? Yeah, I know how you got that dog bite. I don't savvy what you're driving at. Come on, we'll have a few drinks. You're just down the dumps. No, oh, Manny, I ain't just down in the dumps. I know how you got that dog bite, and I know where you got it. What, what do you mean? I mean we're through, Manny. I've been keeping quiet for a long time now, but there's a limit to everything. What I saw today... Was All right, Sir, si, let's have it. Come on. Well, I knew when you was taking cash from the safe, Manny. But I figured if you needed it, that was your business, so I didn't say anything. And you started bringing them low-down friends of yours in here. You better be careful what you say, Sir. Si. I'm getting this off my chest, and then you're getting out of here. Even when them mangy-looking crooks was fleecing everyone who'd play a game of poker with them. Because they was your friends, it was all right. And as long as I got half interest in this cafe, they can still come here. Well, if you're smart, you'll get out of the Yukon, Manny. When them fur robberies started, I, I didn't connect anything at first. That is, I didn't until you began flashing around so much extra money. I won that money at poker. You ain't never held a winning poker hand in your life, and you know it. But I got all I can take this morning. I was at Split Rocks, Manny. And I saw what happened to Jim Glynn. Why, you... You don't worry, I'll keep quiet. You're clearing out of this cafe. You and all your friends, Manny. You and me are through, do you hear? I don't care if I ever see you again. Not gonna be Manny and Cy didn't realize that as they talked, their voices took on the loud argumentative ring that carried to the ears of Manny's friends playing poker in the back of the cafe. Well? It's us, Manny. The door opened, and led by Tom Bryant, six men filed into the room, their hands resting on their guns. Sai's appraisal of their worth left no margin for improvement. The dregs of the Yukon stood in that room, and Sai, as he glanced over the lot of them, shivered. Well, <coughs> we thought you might... This is a private argument. You boys can clear out. They can clear right out of the cafe while they're at it. Are you going to tell them, Manny, or will I? You'll regret this, Sai. I ain't regretting nothing. Only thing I'm sorry for is the day we went into business together. I think we'd better stick around, boys. Now get out, all of you. You can't prove a thing, Sire. I can prove everything I said. That hand of yours. I was... told you you'd better get him out of the way. If you won't drop him, I will. <laughs> my arm! Let go of my arm! I'm going to finish you off right now. Drop that gun, buddy. Why, you yellow scum? Oh, you, you ain't hit, Manny. Uh, oh. Manny. Manny. No, you don't. You've done what you set out to. Hey, let me see that man. You better take care of Newton, Monty. You still got life in him. Come on, Rube. After you two, help me carry him out. Just a minute. All right, boys. Come on. Yes, King, I know. We shouldn't have let them get away. There's something mighty strange here. Oh. I think this might be the best way to get to the bottom of it. Oh, my head. It'll be all right, Si. Got a nasty bump there. You saw it all, Sergeant Preston. No, Si, I didn't see it all. I saw Manny draw his gun. 
Next thing I knew, you'd fired and Bryant rushed up to Manny before he fell. Oh, I did it all right. I killed him, Sergeant. Now listen, Si. I want you to tell me exactly what happened from the beginning. Then when I tried to go up to him, Brian... T- yes, I know. Brian's pretty free with his fists. I didn't aim to do no shooting. I didn't, I didn't even think I hit him when he dropped. You couldn't hit the front of a house at ten feet, Si. What are you looking for, Sergeant? Manny drew first. I saw him. Yeah, but what's that got to do with it? He could have easy killed me and... Oh, well. I guess it's up to you now, Sergeant. I'll just come along. Uh, wait, wait a minute. Well, I'm under arrest, ain't I? Well, I can't arrest you. Manny's proven dead. Now, let's see... You were standing right here. I can't see what you're driving at. It seems to me... Uh, You stand here, Si. Here? Yes. Now... Ah. I thought so. What? I've got a murderer to catch, Si, and I need your help. A rumor spread through Melville City like wildfire. As one man told another, the story gained importance. Soon, even the most incredulous of the miners were repeating the news. Sergeant Preston brought Jim Glynn into Melville City on his sled. Jim, badly wounded, was being cared for in a room at the Silver Lantern, and Cy was held in jail. Will he be able to name the men who robbed him, Sergeant? If Jim Glynn is able to speak, he'll undoubtedly name the man who tried to murder him. The miners and trappers who frequented the Silver Lantern speculated. Was Cy responsible for the robbery as well as for the murder of Manny? Cy confessed yet, Sergeant? Cy refuses to talk. Did you hear the news, Manny? Yeah. Preston's waiting for Jim Glenn to talk. I wonder if Glenn saw us. We can't take no chances. He might have had a good long look at us while we was loading our sled. What do you aim to do? We'll make sure he don't talk. Late the next night, two men approached the back entrance to the Silver Lantern Cafe. Lucky you had that key, Manny. Yeah. So I ain't been around to change a lock. <laughs> you can't change much when you're in jail. Come on, let's get this over with. I don't know why you're so dead set in making sure you're getting this time. You ain't got a thing to worry about. As far as everybody knows, you're dead. But if Glenn talks, I'll be the one to be jailed for that shooting. That Molly hadn't picked him up. Come on. He ought to be in this room. Yeah. He's sleeping. He'll never know what hit him. Go on. Let him have it before he wakes up. You're covered. Drop that gun, Brian. Trust him. Reckon I can get up now, eh, Sergeant? Yes, I can help tie your ghost friend here. So you're very much alive, Manny. Uh, I thought You that... believed that story about Jim Glynn being still alive, didn't you? You brought him in on your sled. We brought Jim's body to Melville City. Then Cy told the barkeep we'd use the back room here for Jim till he recovered. We've been tricked. You ain't been tricked any worse than you tried to trick me, you low-down skunks. I'd have hung for killing you, Manny. You're under arrest, both of you. You'll have to get me first, Manny. I'll shoot, Manny. Let go. All right, now shoot, Manny. If you do, you'll hit Cy. Go on, Sergeant, shoot. Yeah, shoot. I'm getting out of here, see? I'm using Cy for a shield. Had him, King. Get him, boy. Oh, my hand. Let go of my hand. Here, Cy, you keep this gun on Bryant. All right, King. That's the second dog to catch your left hand, isn't it, Manny? You're under arrest. Yes, King, the case is closed. Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, brought to you every Saturday at this time, originated in the transcription studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bill Morgan speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The challenge of the Yukon. King, the swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets 
The challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region. And the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. Sergeant Preston, on patrol duty in the Yukon, made many friends who were always glad to see him. One of these was Ab Crowley, who lived with his wife in a small cabin several miles north of Three Forks. A vicious storm had swept wind and snow in the face of the Mountie as he drove his team toward the small settlement, and the prospect of a warm cup of tea with the Crowleys was something he looked forward to. The great dog King ran ahead of the sled, cutting tracks in the snow. I'm King! on you Huskies! <coughs> Not much further, King. Ah, uh, there's the cabin. It's good to see that light. Oh, King! Oh, you Huskies! Hey there, Sergeant Preston. Hello, Ab. How are you? Yeah, fine. I'm mighty glad to see you. Come on in and have a cup of tea. This is just me, Sam. I've been looking forward to having a cup of tea with you ever since I left Broken Wishbone, Ab. How's Mrs. Crowley? Oh, fine. Just fine. Hey, we got some good news for you, Sergeant. Yes? Well, what is it, Ab? Uh, you'll wait for a few minutes. You go on inside. I'll take care of the dogs. You too, King. Go on in there. <laughs> All right, King. <laughs> Thanks, Ab. Land's sake, Sergeant Preston. Sure is good to see you. Come on in here and close that door. Well, how are you, Miss Scully? Never been better in my life, Sergeant. Did Ab tell you the news? Oh, no, he didn't. He said it could wait till he got inside. Say, what's this all about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I expect the better to let Ab tell you. He's been hankering to tell you ever since we... Uh-oh. There, I almost told you myself. <laughs> well, I'm certainly curious. Uh, tell me this much. You both look so pleased, it must be something awfully good, huh? It is, Sergeant. It's the best thing that's happened to us ever since we came to this snowbound place. There, there you are. Oh, thank you. Ah, this tea certainly tastes good. Warms you up after all that cold. I guess Ab will be wanting a cup, too, when he comes in. <laughs> hey, did you tell the Sergeant yet, Ada? <laughs> oh, no, she hasn't told me yet, Ab. Well, I reckon I'll tell you myself, Ab. <laughs> As if you didn't want the pleasure of telling them yourself all along. Me and Ada just bought the last chance claim. Last chance? Yep. That was Jeb Fisher's claim, wasn't it? It was. Now it's ours. Well? Well. Oh. Sakes alive, Sergeant. The, the cat gets your tongue. Can't you say any more than that? I declare, Ab, I knew it'd be surprised, but I never thought... Just that... uh, how much do you know about the last chance, Ab? Well, it's a good claim. I saw Jeb turn up some of the dust myself. I think it's a good piece of luck. We uh, had kind of hard time eating Jeb's price, but... Uh... We just took what we'd been saving, and Jeb turned it over to us for the cash. How much cash? Uh, $12,000. All the money we had. Why, what's wrong, Sergeant? Well, Ab, I won't congratulate you on your good luck till we make sure it is good luck. Well, what do you mean, Sergeant? I don't trust Jeb Fisher, Mrs. Crowley. I'm afraid that claim is worthless. But we'll soon find out. Worthless? Of course, I have no proof. Sergeant, I can't say that I've ever known you to be wrong before. But this is once I think you've made a mistake. Why, I saw that dust myself. You're no Chichaco, Ab. You know as well as I do that Fisher could have salted that claim. He could have, Ab. But heaven help us if the sergeant's right. Heaven helps him that helps himself, Ada Gal. I'm going to start in tomorrow working on that ground. You will know how we stand. Well, that's a good idea, Ab. I'll tell you what I'll do. I have some friends at Three Forks who will be glad to lend a hand. Well, I don't like to be any trouble to you. Oh, no trouble at all, Ed. <laughs> I was headed for Three Forks anyway, so I'll stop to see them. Well, we'll be looking for you, Sergeant. Goodbye, Sergeant. Goodbye. All right, King. Get the dogs up. I'm King on you Huskies! <laughs> Thank you. 
Sergeant Preston entered the Moosehead Cafe in Three Forks a short time later. As he moved through the room, he heard a boisterous laugh. <laughs> so I have $12,000 in my pocket, and Crowley's got the deed to the last chance. Yeah, cleaned up on that deal. Yeah, I sure did. <laughs> Poor old Crowley stuck for plenty. Yeah, his own fault. I don't know, Jim. What do you mean? Seems to me it's a pretty yellow trick to pull on a couple as old as the Crowleys. Well, they wanted the last chance, didn't they? I sold it to them. $12,000 must have been all the money they got in this world. Uh, that don't mean nothing to me. Don't you feel at all sorry for folks like them? No, why should I? It was a business deal, that's all. I buy and sell property. Ain't none of my business how people get the money to pay for it, uh, as long as it's cash on the line. You're loco, Sam. Yeah, I guess I just don't see things the way you do. Now listen and take it from me. You'll never get far in the Yukon if you go around feeling sorry for every guy that gets stuck. You're Jeb Fisher, aren't you? Why, yeah. What do you want with me, Monty? I understand Abner Crawley just bought your last chance claim. Yep. Fisher, you know there's no gold on that land. I don't know nothing about that land. I sold him the property. We turned up gold on it. You've sold it claims before. Crowley bought that claim, and I didn't guarantee nothing in right. Whether you guarantee it or not, Crowley believes there's gold on that property. <laughs> then let him dig for it. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe he'll find it. <laughs> you oughtn't to talk to him like that, Jeb. <laughs> Why not? The oh, boy ain't got nothing on me. <laughs> The next day, at the last chance claim, not far from Abner Crowley's cabin, six men helped the old miner work his newly acquired land. Yeah. What's the matter, Ab? Ain't getting tired, are you? Uh, me? No. Well, what's wrong? You know, Rob, Sergeant Preston told me this land was probably worthless. I'm afraid he's right. Oh, <clears throat> well now, uh, Ab, I, I wouldn't be too ready to give up. Me and the boys will stay around as long as you need us. Well, I don't like to Now, nah, don't you worry, Ab. Mrs. Crowley thinks it's better to chow we've had in a year Sundays at Three Forks. Well, I believe that's a sergeant coming now. Looks like it is. Hey there, sergeant. Ho, oh, King. Ho, oh, you huskies. Hello, sergeant. Well, Rob, Hello. see you've kept your word. Ab, yeah, we've been pretty busy, all right. How's it going, Ab? Well, Sergeant, uh, I think maybe you was right. Why, Ab? Poor Ed, uh, I'll have to tell you we paid our $12,000 for a worthless piece of earth. All right. <clears throat> uh, I told him, Sergeant, not to be so willing to give up. I'm not surprised, Ab. No, you too, me. But I wouldn't believe you. Well, there's nothing for us to do now. I'm not so sure about that. Rob and I talked it over yesterday. And here's our plan. A rumor of gold in the Yukon always spread like wildfire. A word dropped in a conversation, sudden activity in a place that had formerly been deserted, and an old miner in town spending money freely. Any one of these things were enough to start men talking, telling exaggerated stories of a new gold discovery. So when old Abner Crowley, long known for the quiet and thrifty way he lived, went into Three Forks carrying a poke of gold dust, the word spread that the last chance claim held fabulous amounts of the precious dust. Did you hear the news, Jeb? What news? About the last chance paying out. Yeah, I heard it. But I thought you said... No matter what I said. Did you know it had... Oh, shut up, Sam. Oh, I begin to see. Shut up, I tell you. <laughs> and you thought you took old Abner. I didn't know the last chance was a strike. <laughs> You're darn tootin' you didn't know it. It'd have never gotten out of your hands if you thought that. Uh, I'd give anything to get that claim back. Uh, what a fool I was. All right, boys, have another drink. It's all on me. <laughs> <laughs> you too, Rob. Have what you want. Thanks, Ab. Don't mind if I do. Ever since you struck it at the last chance... That's of... right, the sky's the limit. Hello there, Ab. Why, Jeb Fisher, the man that sold me the last chance, my best friend. We always thought you was a good businessman, Jeb. What happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, 
You know how it is. <laughs> uh, Ab, I'd like to talk to you. Hey, what do you want to talk about, Jeb? Ain't got much time, you know. Got to get back to the last chance. Me and Ed. Yeah, hey. yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, but I'd like to talk to you. Hey, well, all right. Come on, Rob. Yeah, sure. Where do you want to talk, Jim? Uh, let's go in the back room where we won't be disturbed. Yeah, shoot you, Rob. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, there now. <clears throat> Nobody will bother us in here. Uh, have a chair, boy. Yeah. Sure, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, what's on your mind, Jim? <clears throat> Ab, uh, Ab, when I sold you the last chance, I told you I was planning to leave the Yukon. Yep, that's right, you did, Jeb. Yeah, well, a uh, few things have happened since then, and I've changed my mind. I'm staying here, and I'd like to have the last chance back. You see, when I sold it to you, I thought I was leaving, and I wanted to get my affairs straightened up. Yeah, Jeb, yeah, but deal's a deal. I bought the last chance. I know how you feel. You paid me $12,000 for the last chance. Yep. Cash you did. Uh, I'll uh, pay you fifteen thousand to get it back. No problem. Not interested. Sixteen thousand. Now listen, Jeb. If you was in my place, would you sell her? I'll make it eighteen thousand dollars, Ab. <clears throat> no pay. Don't want to. It costs plenty to work a mine, you know, Ab. I'll give you twenty thousand in cash for that claim. Pretty anxious to get it back, ain't you, Jeb? Right. Hello, Ab. Hello, Sergeant. Uh, Fisher, what are you doing here? Uh, trying to make a deal with Ab here, Monty. What sort of a deal, Ab? Now, you keep out of this, Monty. Jeb wants to buy back the last chance claim, Sergeant. Well... I'll pay him cash for it. Jeb, I think I'll take you up on that. He didn't be uh, getting old. I ought to clear out of the Yukon and let the younger man work the last chance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Glad you feel that way about it, Ab. I'll be right back with the money. The money here will witness the same. <laughs> what to tell you, Am? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Hope it don't take too long getting that money. Yeah. <laughs> well, Sam will have the money here in a minute, Ab. <laughs> yes, sir, I think you're being right smart about it. I hope so, Jeb. I certainly wish you the same kind of luck I had with the last chance. Yeah. Hey. Here, Jeb. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> here you are, Ab. It's all there. Count it if you want. <clears throat> uh, you better count it, Ab. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep, all here. Well, Jeb, last chance is yours again. Here's the deed. Now, Rob, here's that $5,000 to pay back the boys for the gold they lent me and for working at the claim. The gold they lent you? Sure. I figured to look like a man that struck it rich ought to have some gold, so they got together and lent it to me. Look like a man that... Say, what is this? You mean you didn't get that gold from the last chance? We ain't found any gold in it yet, Jeb. Why, you said... I didn't say nothing, Jeb. You came to me wanting to buy back the last chance, and I sold it to you. I've been swindled. You led me to believe you found gold there. What you told me when you sold it was true. The gold's still there. I tell you, we ain't touched any of it. Oh, are you out? I wouldn't do that if I were you, Jeb. That was a fair sale. I saw it myself. Looks like you're stuck with your own bargain, Jeb. There's not a thing you can do about it. <laughs> All right, boys. Come on outside. This time, I'll treat you the best in the house, and I'll pay for it with my money. <laughs> well, looks like Abner Crowley came out all right after all. <laughs> yes, King, the case is closed. Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, brought to you every Saturday at this time, originated in the transcription studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bill Morgan speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> King, the swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police 
who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region, and the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. <laughs> As Sergeant Preston pulled into Cass City, a sharp wind cut alongside the frame building that sheltered the group of men standing in its protection. So deep were they in conversation that curious passers-by joined them and in turn were caught up in a heated discussion. Ah, I tell you, all I had to see was them prints. Ain't nobody in the Yukon with feet that big. But why did Ben Barton want to kill Matt Lawson? Don't make much sense to me. I heard Ben tell Lawson he'd get him when they had that fight in the cafe yesterday afternoon. He sure didn't waste much time. Hey, here comes Sergeant Preston. Sergeant Preston! Hey, Sergeant Preston! Hello, King. How are you, Husky? Good thing he's here. Hello, boys. What's the meeting about? Boy, ain't you heard? Matt Lawson was murdered. Murdered? Yep. Out on Wishbone Creek. You might just as well get ready for another shock, Sergeant. I can't believe it. Who'd murder Matt Lawson? Uh, Matt had his enemies, all right. But your friend Big Ben Barton is the man that done it. Why, Will, Ben wouldn't. Sergeant, we know Ben's your friend. But that ain't gonna save him now. Now, wait a minute, Will. If Ben's guilty, he'll be punished. The law doesn't recognize friendship when a crime's been committed. But what evidence have you? You can't make a statement like that, you know, without proof. We got proof, all right. You're darn tootin'. No one else in the Yukon wears shoes the size of Ben's. Now, do they, Sergeant? Well, no, I guess they don't. Ben's about the biggest man in the Yukon. Well, the prints that was found in the snow are Ben's. No. Yep. He might have saved your life, but he took Matt Lawson's sure as there's a sun in the sky. And prints are as plain as day. No, sir. That noose is as good as around his neck right now. Not so fast. Noose isn't around anyone's neck. Yet. What time was Matt killed? Any of you know that? Well, we know this much. He was killed after 10 o'clock last night. After 10, huh? Yep. The snow stopped falling about 10, you see. So it'd have to be after that, else the prince wouldn't be there so plain. Mm-hmm. Well, men, that should take the finger of suspicion from Ben. Well, how do you figure, Sergeant? Because Ben was with me last night from 9.30 till about 8 this morning. Well, what's wrong with you, men? <laughs> well, I hate to say it. I never thought... Uh... Neither did I, Will. Will? Sam? You might be the law up here, but by golly, Sergeant, if you aim to let Barton know... We'll take the law in our own hands. That's what we'll do. You can see how we feel about it. If you men do that, you'll be guilty of murder yourselves. I promise you this. If you're right, there won't be any need to take the law in your hands. But first, we've got to make sure an innocent man isn't punished for a crime he didn't commit. Well... You've got to give Ben a chance. I'll stay in Cass City till we find who murdered Matt Lawson. You'll have to find some way to explain them prints. We'll have to find an explanation for a lot of things. Come on, King. We've got work to do. Get the dogs up. I'll see you men later. All right. Goodbye. Bye. On King! On you Huskies! <laughs> When Sergeant Preston left the small group of men, he headed his team for Big Ben Barton's cabin, further north toward the edge of Cass City. I hope he's there. I've got to talk to him. Oh, King, how are you, Husky? All right, King, come on, fella. We'll see if Ben's inside. Sergeant Preston, am I glad to see you. Hello, Ben. I'm anxious to see you, too. Well, come on inside. Hi there, King. Well, I guess you heard. Yes, that's why I hurried to see you. Hey, I don't know what to do. Now, Ben, listen. I know you didn't kill Matt Lawson. He just sold in Cassidy, you believe me? I, uh, I just saw Will Stringer and some of the men. I can guess pretty much what they told you. Yes. Well, I'm your prisoner. But I tell you, I didn't do it. Ben, it's a frame-up. If only I hadn't had that fight with Matt. What fight? 
Well, yesterday afternoon in the cafe, you know how them things start. I made a bet with Matt about two weeks ago. Well, Matt never was one to pay off his bets. That was why I jumped him. But uh, he was in a mean humor. Seems he was having some trouble with a boundary on his claim or something. He cussed me out right proper. Hmm. I uh, didn't want to get in any gunplay with him, so I left the cafe. Only when I was leaving, I told him he'd pay me or else. Well, that was bad. Under ordinary circumstances, it wouldn't be, but... With the way things are now, I meant I'd collect that money. Shucks, you can't collect any money from a dead man. Well, money ain't much good to me now. Who heard that fight? Well, let's see. Will Stringer was in the cafe and Snyder. Harkins was there. You know, the same bunch. Yep, with my luck, they was all there and every one of them heard us arguing. So they're basing their opinion on that argument as much as the footprints. Eh? Yep. The footprints is a thing. But how could I be at Wishbone Creek and with you at the same time? Well, they won't believe me, Ben. Because we're friends, they think Why, that... the dirty old down bunch of farmers say, I don't know you're straight as a come out. <laughs> Still the same old Ben, aren't you? With more trouble of your own to think of than ever, and you... Well, you'll still fight for a friend. Well, Sergeant, you know how it is. Why, well, we've been friends for a long time. I'd rather... I'd rather admit I'd done this thing than have anyone think he was trying to protect me. But gosh darn it, you ain't trying to protect me. It's the truth. Who could have been wearing your shoes? Huh? Who could have been wearing your shoes? They were your footprints, were they? Well, they were the prints of my shoes, if that's what you mean, Sergeant. I wasn't in them. Most men in the Yukon have only one pair of boots, but you... With me, it's so hard for me to get shoes to fit that when I seize an extra pair, I buy them up quick. Well, let me see your shoes. I want to see every pair you have. Uh, my shoes? <coughs> sure. Uh, mind if I ask what you want them for? Well, I don't know exactly. Except that I want to see if they've been worn lately. Here they are. Drop one of them. That's a lot of them. Don't own another pair except what I got on. Which shoes were you wearing last night? Well, the ones I got on. You're sure? Sure, I'm sure. Took them off last night beside my bed and put them on there this morning. It wouldn't be hard for someone to sneak up here and borrow a pair and then put them back, would it? I reckon not. I'm in and out of my cabin a lot, and the mud around here has been walked on too much to show any new footprints. <laughs> Uh, let's see now. No, not these. Hmm. What do you see there? Yeah, these shoes are wet. These are the shoes the murderer wore last night. And he stepped in one of the mud holes. They're wet inside as well as out. Well, I'd be... Wet and muddy. Ben, these shoes may prove your innocence. How can they do that? I'll get my knife out. You mind losing a pair of shoes? Not if they'll save my neck, I don't. Yeah. We'll soon know whether they will or not. Yeah, these shoes are well put together. Almost a shame to cut them apart. Yeah, now we'll soon know it. Mm -hmm. Just as I thought. Yeah, look here. What? Here. Here's the footprint of the man who wore these shoes when he killed Matt Lawson. Say, then that proves... This proves that we're looking for a man much smaller than you are. Well, that foot's sure a lot shorter than mine. Oh, uh, he'd be, let's see, about six feet tall. I'd say about 180 pounds. Well, it might be almost any one of a dozen. Yes, yes, that's true. Now, what we want to do is line up the men who might have wanted to kill Matt. Then fit the print of their foot to the print in his shoe. Yeah, but... Uh... But who'd be likely to kill him? Well... Who'd have the chance to pin the crime on you? Someone was in the cafe yesterday and heard that argument. Yeah, but there was a crowd there. You can't... You want Matt out of the way. Come on, Ben, think. Well, there's Sam Snyder. Old Matt a heap of money. He was in the cafe? Yep. And uh, Harry Knight. But him and Matt ain't been friendly for years. He wouldn't all of a sudden just... Who up else? Well, Will Stringer. Will's claims on the same hill match was... But then they was always friendly. Any more? No. Listen, to be the barkeep, and you know Johnny didn't have nothing to get mad. 
One thing Matt Aldis paid for was his drinks. Well, that's three men. And I have a hunch that in that three we'll find the man who's trying to frame you, Ben. Early the next day, three men gathered in Ben Barton's cabin at the far edge of Cass City. Will Stringer, Harry Knight, and Sam Snyder. Any one of whom might have murdered Matt Lawson. As soon as I got the message, I came. Yeah, me too. Wonder what that bounty's got up his sleeve. Oh, hard to say. Well, I'll say this much. Barton still ain't under arrest, is he? Wait a minute, Will. Here comes the bounty now. Sorry to keep you men waiting here. Yeah, it ain't no waiting we mind, Sergeant. But what's this all about? Why'd you send for us? Yeah. Something happened? I want all you men to step into this mud and walk across the floor on your bare feet. What? That's why I sent for you, Will. <laughs> it's all right with me. I'll try anything. <laughs> Mind if I go first? I'd like to get this over with. Fine. Uh, you fellas take your shoes off, too. Over here, Harry. Right in this mud here. Like this? Yes. I'll walk across the bare floor. You ready, Sam? I guess so. First time I ever did this. Can't say I'm mine, long as you got a reason for it. Will? Oh, I'd like to know what it's all about. Oh? We'll go into that in a few minutes. Over here first, Will. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, that's the lot of you. Now we'll soon know what we want. Well, what do you want to know? I'll just compare these now. Nope. Well, what's that? Looks like part of a shoe. Yes, it is part of a shoe. Part of the shoe the murderer wore when he killed Matt Lawson Tuesday night. You mean... Ben didn't wear them shoes? You can't expect us to believe that. Ain't nobody here with feet that big. It isn't unheard of for one man to wear someone else's shoes, is it? Nobody could wear Ben's shoes. Well, for that matter, the shoes wouldn't necessarily have to fit the man wearing them. The man who killed Matt wore these shoes. When he wore them, he forgot one thing. You see, he stepped into several of the deep mud holes around here. The water and mud went down into the shoes. But the one he stepped out of them, the print of his foot was left in them. Say now. One of the footprints on the floor matches the print in the shoe. Comparing them will tell who murdered Matt and who tried to frame Ben. Well, what are you waiting for? By golly, let's get this thing cleared up. Not so fast. You ain't comparing anything, Preston. Will. Put that gun down, Will. I'm giving the orders around here now. Will, I never... Ah, shut up. So that's it, Will. I should have known when Ben told me your claim's in the same hill as Matt's that you'd have a reason for wanting him out of the way. <laughs> now that you know, it ain't going to do you any good. You're under arrest. Oh, you can't talk to a man holding a gun like that, Sergeant. I have to kill Ollie. I'm going to make... Well, glad you got here, Ben. You're just in time. Shut that door. Now go on. Line up over there with the rest of them. All right, King Adam. Oh. Get the gun, sir. Get the gun. I've got Will. You get the gun. Good work, Harry. Good work. <sighs> Swear nothing after that talk of yours knocked him over. Will, this is the end for you. Oh, that was pretty smart, Sergeant. No, don't mind telling you. I'm already sorry about the well, That's way all right, Sam. Will's conscience gave him away. What do you mean, his conscience? It was them footprints that done it? No, not entirely. You see, the prints on the shoe weren't plain enough to tell which of you three men wore them. Well, now, be. Yes, King, you deserve some credit, too. The case is closed. <laughs> Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, brought to you every Saturday at this time, originated in the transcription studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bill Morgan speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> King, the swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region. And the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed.
But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. <laughs> The cold bit into Sergeant Preston and the great dog King as they broke a trail through the icy stillness of the Yukon. The 50 below zero temperature was bone chilling in spite of heavy clothing. Even his parka did not protect the Mountie from the painful, jagging stabs of a merciless wind. Uh, thank heaven we'll soon be at Duke Wells' cabin, King. Just over the ridge. <coughs> on King! On you huskies! Uh, we'll soon be warm and... Well, that's strange. Ho, oh, King! Ho, oh, you huskies! Ho! Oh. No smoke coming from that chimney. There must be someone there. Tracks are all around the cabin. Well, Duke wouldn't be without a fire in this weather. Hmm. If it weren't for these tracks here, I'd think Duke had left Sutter's Creek. Yeah, look in this way. There's something wrong in there. Come on, King. <coughs> yes, King. Must have been some fight. Chairs overturned, table broken. Duke! Oh, Duke! The fire's died out. <coughs> what is it, King? Yes, King. He's dead. And it looks like he fought hard. But who? And why? Hmm. His cash box. So it was robbery as well as murder. And not a thing to... Those tracks outside the cabin. these tracks here leading to the cabin. But there are two sets of them. Oh, I see. These are the footprints of the murderer as he came to the cabin and when he left. And these over here, these are Duke's prints. So he was killed after it stopped snowing. King, get the dogs up. <laughs> So that's why there was no smoke coming from the chimney. We have a murderer to track. And only some footprints in the snow for a clue. I'm king! Are you hosting? Sergeant Preston drove his team on and on as he followed the killer's tracks from Duke's cabin. Sharp and clear, they led through the snow. On King! On you huskies! <laughs> right into Deadwood City, huh? Well, we might be lucky, King. This kind of weather, there won't be too many other tracks. We'll be able to follow the... Oh, King! All you huskies! Ho! Oh. Hmm. Let's see. There are other tracks. Plenty of them. It won't be as easy as I thought. All right, King. You lead from here on. On King! On you husky! There were other tracks cut in the snow as the Mountie drove his team into Deadwood City. But King, running ahead, followed the trail till he stopped at last outside the Idle Hour Cafe. Oh, you husky! Ho! Oh. Well, this is it, huh, boy? And the murderer came here after killing Duke. Uh, Sergeant Press. Hello there, Will. How are you? Fine, fine. Say, you ain't been traveling far in this weather, have you? From Sutter's Creek. <laughs> Seems to me you'd be better off making your living pan in gold. At least you don't have to be out when the old thermometer drops down to below zero. Well, the law never rests, you know. Uh, you never rest anyways. It's a good thing, too. See that fella drinking down there at the end of the bar? Yes, he... Smith. Bart Smith. Yep. 
recognized him as soon as he stepped in here. I got a circular in my pocket here. It's somewhere is here, darn it. Yeah. Uh, you see? Picture and everything. I think I begin to understand. <laughs> Smith and Duke Wells used to work together back in the States. Well, that's a fact. Of course, it ain't generally known that Duke ever crossed the law, but we get all kinds in the Yukon. Wells has been pretty straight lately. Settled down a lot. I guess he didn't want to get mixed up with Smith again. <laughs> he's smart. He'll stay away from that varmint. You can tell to look at him. He's rotten all the way through. Yes, that would be the motive then. When he saw the cash box, he couldn't pass up a chance for loot. What are you talking about? Cash box loot? What are you aiming at, Sergeant? How long has he been here, Will? Blew mm -hmm. him about an hour ago with a roughest gang I ever saw. An hour ago, huh? Yep. Say, uh, what do you have? It's on the house, you know. Oh, thanks. I'll have Oh, it. never mind. Don't tell me. I'll get you a glass of milk. How's business? Oh, it's coming right along. This kind of weather is mighty helpful. <laughs> Fellas like to come in and swap yarns over some drinks. But all they can do when the ground's throw solid. Yes. Looks as if all Deadwood City's in the idle hour. Don't hurt my feelings none, long as they pay in gold. Say, uh, Sergeant, what's eating you? Faces a mile long. I told you I'd just come in from Sutter's Creek. Yeah? Ain't nobody much up there. I stopped at Duke Wells' cabin. He's dead, Will. Dead? Murdered. King and I trailed the killer here. Well, will be. You think Smith had I don't know. Who was the last man in here before I came? That's a kind of a hard one to answer. I noticed so I could swear to anything. Seems to me old Harry Barber was the last one in. That was about 10 or 15 minutes ago. But like I say, I couldn't swear to it. Smith or one of his men we could approve anything. No, the only thing I can do is compare his footprints with the prints I found outside Duke's cabin. You can't do that now. Why? Well, take a look outside. Must have got a mite warmer. Snow. Yeah. Looks like a blizzard to me. Hmm. Uh, Sergeant, I ain't the one to meddle with the law. But, but what will? You won't be able to pin anything on him. That gang of his that swear to an alibi, and you know it. Where are they? In the back room, playing poker. Well, maybe Bart Smith didn't do it. Any one of his men could have done it for him. Well, looks like you got a real problem on your hands. Oh, uh, excuse me a minute, will you? Oh, sure, sure, Will. Hey, another drink here, Will. What do you have, Dan? Oh, shame. Pick it up. Well, hello, Sergeant Preston. Uh, hello, Dan. Hey, mighty cool, lad, ain't it? And if I don't wish I was down in the tropics somewhere. As long as you can find gold up here, you'll never leave it for the tropics or any other place. You know it. Yeah, I reckon you're right, Well, it Gets in a man's blood. Well, better get back to the game. Winning or losing? Breaking even, the worst, Rick. <laughs> See you later, Sergeant. Yeah, nice fella, Dan. How long has he been in the cafe? Oh, now, you don't think Dan... Do don't I? jump to conclusions. I'm only checking a few points, that's all. You'll be asking me next what time I got here. Well, but uh, what are you going to do about this? Well, some of the boys are leaving now that the small started. If you're going to do anything, you better... Waiting till a few more of the boys leave. Then I have a little plan. <laughs> Sergeant Preston, with the faithful king at his side, waited till most of the crowd left the cafe. Soon there were but a handful of men gathered around the pot-bellied stove at the far end of the room, and a scattered few were still at the bar. What's that Marty doing here, bud? I don't know. Been in here now for an hour. He stands there drinking milk and looking around. I don't know who he is? Yeah. Molly's a Molly to me. Not this one. That's Sergeant Preston. Preston? Yeah. If Preston's after you, you might as well throw up your hand. It's the end of the trail. Not for me, it ain't. Want me to call out the rest of the boys? No. We'll call them if I need an alibi. There ain't no way he'd know you and well. Shut up, will you? 
Why don't you go out front and beller so the whole town can hear you? Oh, now, Bart, I didn't mean nothing. I guess I'm just uneasy. I didn't plan to let Duke have it. He wouldn't split the claim, huh? Split it? He didn't want to have anything to do with us. He said he was going straight. Boy, he sure changed. Hey, so the impression you've been standing around looking at us for a long time. Yeah, what are you looking for, Monty? Let's get out of here. No. We'll stay here till the Monty leaves. Yes, you're right, Tom. I am looking for something. Why in Tarnation didn't you say so in the first place? What you got on your mind? I left Sutter's Creek about an hour ago. When I was up there, I stopped in to see Duke Wells. Mm -hmm. I found Duke dead. D dead? Yes, murdered. He'd been fighting with a man who killed him. The fight must have started when the killer pulled a gun on him. Uh, got any idea who done it, sir? When two men are fighting, it's almost impossible not to find a piece of clothing torn from a coat, a few hairs, or a button. Little things like that are what most killers leave at the crime if there's been a struggle. Uh, so that's what you're looking for, huh? Pretty smart. Well, looks like we'd better line up here so you can look us over. Ain't nothing tore off my coat. Yes, that's a good idea. Can't say as I know anyone that'd have any reason to kill Duke. It was a peaceful enough critter. He sure was. Never bothered anyone. Bonnie, I guess this leaves me out. I'm a stranger here in Deadwood City, so I'll just leave while you go on with your investigation. All right, boy. You say you're a stranger? Yeah, yeah. Bart Smith's the name. Just came in from Circle City with Slim here. Well, it's just a formality. I want to see the coat on every man that can pay. That means me too, I guess. Yes, you too, Will. Yeah, don't have any buttons off my coat. Well, let's see. All right, Tom. Now, well, let's see, Dan. Mm-hmm. No, you don't, Monty. Hey, put down that gun. I'll put it down when I'm ready. Now, you get in line. Go on, over there. Listen straight. You're listening to me. Reach. All of you. Higher. You won't get away with this. <laughs> you let me worry that out. He must be the one that killed Yeah, I am. And I'll kill any one of you that steps through the door of this cafe. It means business, fellas. Uh, you you the poor kid. Shut up, Dan. He's already killed Duke Wells, ain't he? I'm leaving here now, see? Come on, Slim. And remember, I'll shoot anyone that steps out of this door. You'll never get through that door, Smith. Adam King, Adam King. Oh, I'll take care of him. Oh, oh. All right, Bart, get up. Oh, my hands, that much. Yeah, nice work, King, old fella. You're pretty handy with your fish, Will. I used to be a prize fatter in my younger days. And boy, how I'd like a chance at that no good rat. Hey, Sergeant. Oh, no, he's under arrest, Will. He deserves a beating, but you'll have to settle for a hanging. Hey, wait a minute. He don't have any buttons off his coat. Oh, that's right. And I don't see any other clues either. No, Will, there aren't any. It was his conscience that convicted him. You see, boys, sometimes a policeman has to play hunches. Well, I'll be pretty smart, I'd say. Yes, King, old boy. With your help, another case is closed. <laughs> Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, brought to you every Saturday at this time, originated in the transcription studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bill Morgan speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> King, the swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region. And the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. (laughs) 
As Sergeant Preston busied himself breaking camp shortly after the light of day crossed the Yukon, he spoke at intervals, half to himself, half to King. Yes, King. Enough time's been wasted already. <laughs> Those crooks have had the run of the Yukon for four months. And I guess that's everything. We've got to put an end to this reign of terror. Trappers are afraid to bring their furs to trading posts. Mask robbers holding them up. And yet, where are they hiding the stolen furs? Well, King, we may soon have the answers to a lot of questions. Put the dogs up, King. On King! On you husky! <laughs> Several miles further north along the trail traveled by the Mountie and his lead dog, King, Joe Simon sat at his desk in the cabin that served as headquarters for his freight line, the only one of its kind in the Yukon. Hmm. Not bad. Besides paying off the boys, clearing expenses, the cold 10000 in profit. Ah, that's the way I like to see a set of books look. Hey, Joe. Oh, hi, Len. Come on in. I want to talk to you, Joe. Yeah, what's on your mind? Sit down, you're out of breath. Yeah, no wonder. You better get ready for a shock. And gloating over them books ain't going to ease it none for you either. What do you mean? I always said the law was going to get wise sooner or later. Is this what you want to talk to me about? I'm busy, Len. These books here. You better use them books for lighting fires. Once that Mountie sees them, you won't be able to... Mountie? Sergeant Preston's on the trail of the fur robberies. Is that why you think we better give up the freight line? Either give it up or start hauling some honest freight. We haul enough freight. There ain't a man in the Yukon that suspect we have anything to do with the stolen furs, and you know it. Hmm. Now, just remember this much. Preston ain't failed yet. Once he sets out on a trail, he gets his man. And I don't aim to be about when he closes in. There's always a first time. Ever hear that? Preston's been riding for a fall. I'm going to see that he gets it. Yeah. Well, I'm betting on Preston. I'm clearing out of this, Joe. I'm leaving on the next boat from Skagway. Here, Jeff. You stay in here. I can't spare you now, and you know it. If it's a bigger cut you want, listen, Joe. You listen to me. Took a long time to build up Simon's freight line, didn't it? You stuck with it then. Driving them honest loads you're talking about way up from Sutter's Creek through the Skagway. That's when the going was tough and the pay was small. But we build up a reputation for ourselves. Folks say we always get the good through. They trust us. There's not a man in three countries to put a finger on us. We're in the clear. We're cashing in. Now, go on out and see how Pete made out in that last call. And don't let me hear any more of this talk. And I don't like it. <laughs> no, sir. I don't like it. The last time, get out there and help Pete, will you? All right. My patience is wore out. I'm telling you, Len, if you don't dress in Preston, didn't you hear that? Hear what? He's outside. I saw him. He's coming in here any minute. Preston. Can you see him out that window? Wait, never mind. I can see him out of this one. The Mounty, all right. You can bet your best beaver at Preston. I better get them books out of the way. Here, pull out these ledgers. You wouldn't listen to me. You knew all the answers, don't you, Mr. Simon? You clean this plate out plaster than anything you ever saw. Shut up. You'll be looking out from behind bars yet. And what's worse, I'm going to be looking out with you. I'll go out with Pete. Go... Come in. Hello there, Joe. Why, Sergeant Preston. How are you, Len? Uh, I'm all right. I, I have to help Pete. Uh, see you later. Yeah, Len. He didn't give him a hand on that load to go to Juno. Sure. I'll tell him. Well, no wonder you run such a successful freight line, Joe. Well, we got a reputation, too, you know. We always get the freight through. Something like the amount of police, huh? <laughs> I never thought much about it, but I guess it is. Yeah, every man in the Yukon feels he can depend on you. That's what I'm in business for. 
Well, make yourselves comfortable while I finish up a little figure in here. Oh, thanks. Ah. Your, uh, your men cover a good bit of territory, don't they? Yeah. Why? Well, maybe, uh, maybe you can give me some information. Oh, what kind of information? I'm looking for stolen furs being sent somewhere. My job is to find out where and who. Mm-hmm. You got any ideas? Well, uh, that's why I'm here. Oh. Well, I lead kind of a lonesome life. I mean, I don't hear much myself being here most of the time. But the boys might be able to give you some help. Uh, when they come in, ask them about it. Well, thanks, I will. I thought I might be able to find what I'm after here. Yeah? I have heard there's been some pretty cold-blooded robberies lately. Almost a hundred in four months. Hmm. And I think they can be stopped. Well, I hope they can. Who knows? Maybe some vomit will get the idea to start robbing a freight line. Then where'd I be? Well, I gotta give the boys some last minute instructions. There's a trail that'll save Pete a lot of time this trip. I'll be back in a minute. Just make yourself to home. Oh, thanks, Joe. We'll do that, won't we, fella? Mm-hmm. Very smart dog. Best in the Yukon. Hmm. He knows something, King. More than he's telling. Yes. Yes, I know. I don't like it either. I wonder. These books are in this drawer here. King, you listen closely for footsteps. Joe's business is a little too good. And all this profit isn't coming from freight. Uh, Alec must have been right. Good thing I met him in Dawson. Uh-huh. Yes, it's all here. Lens cut, Pete. Ben. Who's Ben? Twenty-five hundred? Fifteen hundred? Yeah. We'll go out and look at that load bound for Juno, King. Come on, boy. How much does he know? I don't know how much he knows, but he suspects something. I ain't taking any chances. Well, if he suspects something, you won't be able to throw him off the trail now. Shut up and listen to me for a change. I'll get this load of furs out of here before he starts looking around. Too bad old Kelly stamped his pelt. I'd not even recognize these in a minute. Well, you go with Pete this trip. Uh-huh. As soon as these furs are in Ben's hands, we've got nothing to worry about, see? Yeah. And don't waste any time getting them to him. All right, now, Mush. Oh, wait a minute, Joe. What's he coming out here for? You'll know soon enough. I'd like to look at that load. Can't stop him now. What are you carrying this trip? Why, some gold and the uh, furs? Why, yes, we've got some felts on the sled. Mmm, <laughs> nice looking skin. What are you looking for, Marty? A mark. K to be. Show these furs. Put your hands up. What? Put them up, I said. So I was right. You're not only shipping the stolen furs, you're behind the robbery. Too bad for you, you got wise, Marty. I've been wanting to flatten you out for a long time. It looks like this is it. What are you going to do with them, Joe? Do what's that to put a mounty out of the way? By the time anyone gets wise, we'll be in the States. I don't like we'll it. We'll take that boat at Juno. I'll come on up to the cabin, you. All right. Open the door, Len. Uh, get in there. Get out that fuse and light it, Ben. Then we get ready to mush. Hey, you're not... Go on, beat it. What are you going to do? I'm setting a fuse, locking you in the cabin. And inside of five minutes, you'll be blown to kingdom come. While me and the boys are on our way out of here. I'll never get away with it. You've mushed your last trail, Monty. You got it, Len? Yeah. We don't want to waste any time. All right, I got all the money. I like that fuse. 
I'll take a last look at these windows just to make sure he won't be able to get out. Uh, tighter than a drum. Good. So long, Mountie. Pleasant dreams. Fuses lit us along and give us plenty of time to get away. Might as well throw that key away now. We won't need it anymore. Let's get out of here. <laughs> March, you Malamud! March! King, outside the doomed cabin, knew his master's danger. He watched Joe toss the key carelessly to one side, and as the sled faded from sight, he burrowed in the snow till his teeth struck the metal. Then, standing under a small window, he barked. <coughs> the dog's sharp ears picked up Preston's whistle almost as soon as it left his lips. Every muscle tense, his body sealed, King leaped through the small window. <coughs> Scarcely waiting for the shattered glass to collect on the floor, he dropped the key he'd carried between his teeth at the Maori's feet. King... King, old boy, you saved my life. Uh, we'll soon take care of this. Uh, fuse is cut. Now, King, old boy, after them. Come on. Urged on by Preston, King covered mile after mile of the trail to Juneau. When the Mountie arrived at the busy port city, he relentlessly tracked down Joe Simon. Yep, we're making a trip this time, Ben. Clear it out just when we're... Listen, he's lucky we ain't all in handcuffs. You will be in handcuffs, Len. You're under arrest, all of you. Preston! He ain't getting me, I'm getting... Don't let him get away, King. <laughs> You're coming, Joe. Well, I can't say I'm surprised. <laughs> Bring him over here, King. That's it. <laughs> I arrest all of you for attempted murder as well as the fur robbery. Yes, King. Thanks to you, the case is closed. Upholding the motto of the Northwest Mounted Police, Sergeant Preston and the great dog King maintain the right and get their man. Don't miss their next thrilling adventure when they meet the challenge of the Yukon once again on Saturday at 6.30. Ho, Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, brought to you every Saturday at this time, originated in the transcripts and studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bill Morgan speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> King, the swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region, and the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. <laughs> Side by side, in the center of Prospect City, stood two unpainted frame buildings. In appearance, they differed little. Through their doors, at one time or another, passed every gold-seeking man in the Yukon. 
One was Sam's General Store. The other, Dorner's Bank, held gold from some of the richest loads in the north. Midwinter, the light of day fading quickly to early darkness, Phil Dorner's worst fears were realized. Put him up, Dorner. Hold up. Yeah. One sound out of you and you'll be stiffer than these boards. Go ahead, boys. Clean out the till, Marty. I'll take care of the safe. Wait a minute, Jonas. What for? There's no use of you skinning your fingers open in that safe, long as Dorner here can turn the combination. Say, that's right. And you heard me, Dorner. Get over there to that safe. No. No, I won't open it. You can... <laughs> All right. I'll open it. But you won't get away with this, I tell you. Shut up and open that safe. We ain't here to talk. Let me at that stuff. Wait till Leed sees this hall. I got the dust on the till, Bat. Good. Let's get out of here now. Dorner, if you want to live long enough to talk about this, you better not turn around or we're out of sight, you understand? You're as good as behind bars already. With Sergeant Preston in town, there ain't dogs running that'll save you. <laughs> uh, you'll laugh on the other side of your mouth, you sneaking coyote. It's too noisy, Marty. Yeah. I reckon we better shut him up. What do you want? I'll... <clears throat> Come on. I don't like staying in one place too long. Be quite a while before Sergeant Preston hears anything from you, banker. A little later, a miner stopping to deposit some dust found Phil unconscious on the floor. The alarm spread quickly. Outraged miners and trappers mobbed the bank, while the banker, his hand to his head, told Sergeant Preston the story. How many of them were there, Phil? Three. There was talking of another one, a fellow named Meade. You say they even made you open the safe? Yeah. I tell you, Sergeant, I didn't have a chance. There was three guns ready to I crack. I know. Almost any man would have done the same thing, Phil. $22,000 I had in that safe. What do you aim to do about it? Go after them. They're killers. Sounds to me as though this robbery is tied up with some others that have been committed on the coast. If I'd only drawn it out yesterday when I had a mind to. Why, well, just as soon lost it gambling. Well, but... you heard what the sergeant said, didn't you? You ain't the first one to lose money to this gang. But you'll be among the last to lose money to them. Come on, King. You going to trail them? Well, you'll need help. King's all the help I'll need. See if you can get my 22 Oh, thousand. shut up, Eb. Well, I was just... Get remind... the dog, dog, King. Well, if anyone can get them farmers, Preston will do it. Oh, King! Oh, you husky! There he goes. Yeah? Seems like an awful big job for one man to handle... What you need is a drink, Phil. Come on, close the door. You don't have to bother locking it now. Ain't nothing more to be took. Maybe you're right. Sure, I'm right. You'll feel better before you know it. The great dog, King, followed the trail closely, never once hesitating. Faster than any dog in the Yukon, he was a stern leader, setting the pace for Preston's Huskies. On and on they raced, the distance between the Mountie and the criminals shrinking with every mile. On King! On you Huskies! Further along the trail, heading for a hideout cave, Bat urged his team on. Hush, you Malamutes! Hush! Hey, Bat, I think we ought to pull into the protection of them rocks yonder and wait a few hours. If that Mountie's on our trail... Yeah, we'll... Bat. That won't hurt to rest the dogs a bit anyway. We can't do it out in the open. It's a good idea. Ho, you Malamutes! Ho! Ho up there! Yeah, we'll be safe enough in here. You're sure worried about Preston, ain't you? Me? Listen, when I came to the Yukon, one of the first things I heard about outside of the gold was Preston. Preston and that dog of his. Believe me, I'm not taking any chances. Ah, he'll never catch us. Ah, I heard other men say the same thing. The ones that didn't swing for what they'd done are looking out from behind bars now. Well, he'll never put me behind bars. All the same, I'll stand behind these rocks here and keep an eye on the trail. <laughs> We 
wash in a little while. Yeah. I feel better when we get to the cave. Just wait till Meade sees this hall. You're getting as bad as Marty here. He'll have us all uneasy. So you thought I was dreaming, did you? Well, take a look. Where? Out there, along the trail. Dog team. Yeah, and you can bet half of that gold we're carrying is Preston. Well, I tell you. Get your guns ready. Lay low and wait for him. My guns have been ready. You better take care of your own. Uh, it is Preston. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, he's looking at the trail. That mother, he's a smart old, right? What is it, boy? You're covered, Nani. What? Reach. Easy, boy. Well, Sergeant Preston, I never expected the pleasure of running into you like this. Get his gun, Jonas. And don't try no tricks, Mounty. You got two guns on you. Well, looks like you hold all the aces, boys. Well, what do you aim to do with them, Bat? I don't know. Me would sure enjoy a chance like this. Mead. You mean... Yeah, the same one. He had his brother hung two years ago. Sam Sunniger, you remember? Come on, boys, we'll take him in with us. To the cave? Yeah, and make sure he ain't packing another gun, Jonas. He ain't. Got one in his sled, though. And we'll toss some of that stuff off his sled. You ride it, Jonas. Preston, you ride in front of me where I can keep an eye on you. If that lead dog of yours, as smart as he's supposed to be, he'll take orders from Jonas. You understand? Did you hear that, boy? <coughs> Steady, boy. Hey, my pack. Ah, don't worry. You won't need it where you're going. Keep his gun on the sled, Jonas. All right, boys, let's mush. night, the bank robbers, with Preston, their prisoner, pulled up at a ledge the winded steps clean of snow. Obeying orders, the Mountie knew they would keep him alive till the outlaw Meade Sunninger arrived. Ruthless and cunning, Meade would be merciless in avenging his brother. As they entered a deep cave, King kept close to his master, waiting for the word to jump at these men who held a gun on them. But Preston's only command of the dog was to forbid him to touch the drinking water Marty drew from a spring in the hideout. Help me with this gold, sir. What's the matter? Right, Ain't you hungry? Yes, we're hungry. But not thirsty. Suit yourself. Come on over here, Marty. Fire will be ablaze in a minute and you'll get something to eat. Need any help with the fire? No, you don't. Reach for one of them burning sticks and you'll wish you hadn't. Well, don't worry, Bat. I didn't plan to burn you alive. And I ain't taking no chances. <laughs> For the next two days, neither Preston nor King drank any water. Finally, on the morning of the third day, Marty could contain his curiosity no longer. I don't understand it, Molly. It ain't natural. You're not worried about us, are you, Marty? Me? Leave him alone, Marty. He don't have much longer to wait for me. I ain't bothering with him. All I want to know is why he don't take a drink of water with the rest of us. Because I don't want to take a chance on poison. That's why, Marty. Poison? Yes. You've been drinking that water for two days now, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the answer. Hey, Bat, do you hear that? What do you mean, Monty? You know more than what I said. How do you feel, Jonas? Tell you the truth, I ain't felt so good. All yesterday... Yeah, I knew it, I knew it. It's the same feeling I have myself. You get a little dizzy every once in a while. Then it goes away. Your stomach bothers you. Yeah, it ain't exactly an ache. I don't know, Marty. The way mine feels, I'd say it was more of an ache. So, how about you, Bat? What? Gee, horse fat. Look at him. Can you, can you do anything about this, Preston? Can't you help us? Why, he's whiter than snow. Looks kind of green to me. Step over here in the light till I can get a look at... Marty. Yeah? You were done for. No. Maybe the Marty Oh, I'm sorry, boys. All my medicines are in the pack you threw out on the trail. There must be something to be done. Look at Bat. He... Hey, he ain't passing out on us, Bat. Hey, look, Marty. We'll set you free if you'll help us. Yeah. Sure. What about me? He won't... He won't know anything about it. I'm getting that dizzy feeling again. Name oh. your own price. I can't stand it. I tell you, I... There's only one thing you can do. What? What's, What's that? that? Sulfur might help. 
Sulfur? Well, where are we going to get any? Break your bullets open. Get together all the gunpowder. Then melt some snow from outside. Take a mouthful of gunpowder and wash it down. Hey, where are you going, Bat? To get some snow. Jonas, you and Marty start busting all your bullets open. <laughs> The three men worked feverishly, breaking down their bullets. Bat was the first to swallow the strange antidote. Uh, How much do you have to swallow? Better take another mouthful. No one to take any chances. There. Feel better already? What? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, King, I'll just leave you boys. Wait a minute. Well, you promised me I could. I changed my mind. You loco bat? I heard you. Shut up. You're not going anywhere, Mountie. Stay where you are. And how do you think you'll stop me, Bat? You've eaten all your bullets. Watch them, King. Why, you? Watch that dog. My hand. Let go. Well, the good thing you left my gun on the sled, Bat. All right, King. My hand. Get over there against the wall. Neat. Watch them, King. One of them makes a sound, you know what to do. Reach, Meat. I said reach. That's right. We meet again, Meat. You and your bank robbers are coming back to Prospect City with me. Then to Dawson and jail for all of you. Let you shoot him. How do you ever get the drawing yet? Why, well, he made us eat our gunpowder, Mead. Eat your gunpowder. The boys here felt they had a touch of water poison. Yeah, Mead. We was drinking the water here in the cave. And yeah. he's... What are you, the cave? There ain't nothing wrong with this water. Well, there probably isn't. Pro- he said it was poison. I didn't say anything about it being poison. I only said I don't take a chance on poison, Bat. Your own imaginations took care of the rest. <laughs> yes, King, the case is closed. <laughs> Upholding the motto of the Northwest Mounted Police, Sergeant Preston and the great dog King maintain the ride and get their man. Don't miss their next thrilling adventure when they meet the challenge of the Yukon once again on Saturday at 6.30. (laughs) Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, brought to you every Saturday at this time, originated in the transcription studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bill Morgan speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. King, the swiftest and strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. (laughs) Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region, and the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. The jail in Machete City was a small building that had sturdily withstood the fury of Yukon storms and the strength of desperate prisoners bent on shaking its dust from their feet. In the light of early morning, two men stood talking to the one inmate who nervously paced the floor. Think I like walking up and down this place? Waiting for you two? Oh, take it easy, Con. Easy? 
I'm warning you. If you think I'm going to rot in this place while you two walk free, you're daft. It takes I, time to figure I this out. I ain't got much time. And neither of you. Unless you get me out of here soon, you might just as well move in now. I'm not hanging alone. Get me? You won't hang? No. You're darn right I won't hang. I got enough on you to see you both swing, and the Monty knows it, see? All I gotta do is open my mouth. I can't spring you overnight. This place is tighter than a drum. My patience ain't gonna last much longer. Well, you got another week, ain't you? Another week. Last Tuesday it was two weeks. Tomorrow it'll be six days. Then five. Then four. And it's me that's getting closer to that noose, not you. How I get out of here is your worry. Listen, Khan. We ain't let you down yet. Just wait a little while. We'll get you out. Don't worry. Come on. Let's get out of here. Remember what I said. You all true, boys? Yeah. We just wanted to cheer Khan up a bit. I guess he needs cheering. Now tell the sergeant you two dropped in to see him. That's all right with us. Outdoors, the two men walked aimlessly through the straggly settlement of frame buildings. One thought was uppermost in both their minds. If he talks ace, we're as good as done for. Yeah. Him. That Mountie's been waiting to pin something on us for a long time now. We either got to make sure Khan keeps quiet or get him out of there. But how? I don't know. Come on, let's go in and have a drink. I can sure use one. Hey, boys. Hey, usual, Shorty. You two beat? Yeah. 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 Yeah, you boys sure look low enough. Of course, I can't say I'd feel much better myself if I was in your shoes. What do you mean? Well, it uh, ain't none of my business, but everybody knows Con ain't leaving this world unless you two go with him. Your business is filling glasses. You better stick to it. Oh, he didn't mean nothing, Ace. Come on, let's sit down. That's right, I didn't mean nothing. Yeah. yeah. Looks like it ain't no secret. Yeah. That's one of the reasons we can't catch that Molly off guard. He's the first guy I ever met you couldn't buy off. Ain't no use talking about buying them off. You could assume buy off the Queen's crown. Trouble with these Mounties is you can't buy them or scare them. And he swore to get us. Well, if we don't get Khan out of that jail, he ain't going to have much trouble doing it either. You know, if he only had a weakness. He don't drink, he ain't got a family. What's a family got to do with it? Well, you ain't forgetting how to think, are you? If he had a family, we could... Say, what? You're right. What do you mean, right? I ain't said nothing yet. Sure you did. Don't you see? See what? You're going loco, Ace. Now, listen. He ain't got a family, right? I just said that. Yeah. But he's got that mud of his, ain't he? He thinks an awful lot of that oh, dog. Oh, yeah. I see what you mean. And what's to stop oh, us you're from... You're right. We'll have that mounty eaten out of our hands. Later that day, as Sergeant Preston was entering the jail. All right, King. You stay out here, boy. Hey, Sergeant Preston. Yes? You want to see you a minute? You want to see me about Khan? You know the answer. Well, as a matter of fact, that's what we did come to see about. I won't release him under any circumstances. I'm just sorry you boys aren't in there with him. Well, we warned you, Monty. Yeah, we ain't asking anymore. Next time, we'll demand that you release him. I haven't time to listen to threats. You'll have time, all right. What do you mean by that? You'll either let Khan out, or else. (laughs) 
Later that night, with darkness to cover them, the two men walked quietly down the street. I tell you, I saw him at the jail not a half hour ago. All right, I just wanted to be sure. I'm sure. Don't worry about that. The, there's a light in the office. Yeah. Yeah, I see him. He ain't taking no chances. <laughs> but this is one thing he ain't expecting. You have the blanket ready? Yeah. I'll walk in front of the mutt to get his attention. And you drop the blanket over him before he can set up a howl. Yeah. And remember, the dog's mighty smart. The sooner we get him out of here, the better it'll be for us. Here's his coming. I told you, ain't no dumbbell. I'll do just like I said. Now, take this end of the blanket. Got it. I'd sooner wrestle a grizzly in this mutt. He's got plenty of fight. Come on, let's get out of here. I left the sled back of sand. Don't try to follow us, Mounty, or this dog's as good as dead. Uh, the dirt hurt him. There's the sled. Come on. You won't get away with it. Marsh, you husky. Marsh. King fought his captors valiantly, but the dog was at a disadvantage. For even after they reached a cave on a high ledge overlooking the trail, Pete kept the blanket over him. Why don't you take that blanket off him now? Listen, I ain't forgetting this mutt nipped me once. <laughs> I clean forgot that. Well, I ain't. Still got the marks of his teeth in my arm. Oh, sir, I'm keeping the blanket over him. Take it off in the morning. Before I see Preston, I'll tell Calm. Well, you better. That's a yellow rattle. Think we still ain't done nothing towards getting him out. Oh, I don't know. You probably heard Preston looking for the dog. Maybe he'll put two and two together. Only thing he can put together is his gun. <laughs> I can't wait to see the expression on that Mounty's face. <laughs> if Ace had seen the steely determination in Sergeant Preston's eyes as he stood talking to two friends in the Golden Goose Cafe... The outlaw's amusement would have cindered to ashes and the fear would have clutched his heart. Why, the low-down varmints, anyone that would steal a dog. They think by holding King that I'll bargain with him for the release of Con Mason. Uh, guess they tried every other way to spring him. They ought to be right behind the bars with him. Yes, and they will be. Con has already told what he knows. Oh, I see. But they don't know that. That's it exactly. Oh, every minute King's in their hands. No, I... Sergeant. I reckon they ain't real men. But I don't think they'd do anything to the dog till they try to make a deal with you. Oh, you can't trust men like that. You can't blame them for not wanting to take any chances, Joe. I'm with you, Sergeant. If I can be of any help... That's what I hoped you'd say. You mean you're going after them varmints now? Yes. And here's what I want you to do. It was dawn when Sergeant Preston and his two friends reached the trail far beneath the cave where King was an unhappy captive. Dark as it was, the determined Mountie had tracked the kidnappers. His eyes brightened as he glimpsed the light of a campfire thrown out over the rocks high above him. Meanwhile, in the cave... Too bad we couldn't have let Khan know about this. I'm telling you, it'll be a load off of my mind when he's out of that jail. He'll be out, too. Preston thinks a lot of that mutt, no more than the dog does of him. He hasn't made a sound lying in that blanket. Ah, looks to me like he's waiting for something. What? Listen. He's whining. Somebody's down the trail. Yeah, probably a couple of miners on the way to Machete. Yeah, well, I'm making sure. Ain't no miners on the trail at this hour. Hey! Hey! Yeah? Hey, it's Preston. What? Grab that mutt. Put that blanket you open. You grab him. I'm getting my gun. He'll jump. Well, let him. He's a dead dog if he tries it. Jump forward. Jump. Hear that? He's going to do it. In blind obedience to his master's command, King leaped over the ledge. 
A dizzy, breathtaking drop. Hold that blanket tight, men. Yeah, here he comes. Oh, yeah. King. Now, boy. Good fella. Good fella, that's it. I never see anything like it. That was a right smart idea to get this blanket to catch him in. The way he come flying through space. Hey, Sergeant, where are you going? After those two. Come talk to I have enough evidence to hang them. You can't climb up there. It's the only way up. Here, I'll cover him with my gun as well as I can. Here comes Preston. Get back, Mountie. I'm coming after you, Ace. That's what you think. Oh, missed him. Here, let me get him. Ah, them rocks protect him. Ace. Ace. Just put your head out once more, Mountie. Just once more. Ace, listen, I'm out of bullets. You stand over here. We're... What'd you say? I tell you, I ain't got any more bullets. Well, where are they? They're in a pack over there, and we ain't got time to get them. He's coming. Wait, let's see how many I got. Wait a minute. How many? Uh, one. One more. Yeah, he's almost up here. Let him have it, Ace. Go ahead. Well, here goes our last shot. You get him? I don't know. Listen. Are oh, you still coming? Oh, no, you're wrong. I'm here. All right, you boys are under arrest. You ain't got nothing on us. No. Khan was afraid you decided to leave the Yukon. You mean he talked? Yes. It's going to be a triple hanging this time. I'll start marching down that path. And I wouldn't try any tricks. Two men have guns waiting for you down on the trail. And mine's right in back of you. Yes, King. The case is closed. <laughs> Upholding the motto of the Northwest Mounted Police, Sergeant Preston and the Great Dog King maintain the right and get their man. Don't miss their next thrilling adventure when they meet the challenge of the Yukon once again on Saturday at 6.30. Challenge of the Yukon, the copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, brought to you every Saturday at the same time, originated in the transcription studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bob Height speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> on King, on you Husky. <laughs> King, the swiftest and strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. (laughs) Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region. And the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. Train Junction's name told its whole story. One of the few locomotives in the North ran through the rich, boisterous settlement lying at the far end of a wide horseshoe bend that the tracks made around Skillet Lake. There she comes. Hey, you sure? Can't see a thing myself. It is. Stump for water across the lake. Well, Sam, I'll say this much. There's no arguing with your eyes. I expect she'll be over here in ten minutes or so. Oh, it's getting dark. You know, it's a wonder that thing don't lose its way. <laughs> Sergeant Preston, come to see the engine pulling in, too? Well, not exactly, Sam. Just have to be around here. Never miss seeing it myself. Hey, 
Lynch. Hey, hey, it's Lance Brown. Hey, Lance. Hey, Lance. Hello, Sam. Be right over. You know, as long as I've been watching this train here, I never rolled in one. Why don't you try it sometime, Sam? By golly, I sure would like to. Well, when you make up your mind to make the trip, let me know. I'll speak to the engineer. He might let you ride in the cab. Say, would you know? You and the law are standing so close together, Sam. They quite a picture. <laughs> oh, listen to him. <laughs> oh, you never want to get in a card game with him, Sergeant. <laughs> well, don't worry about that. Did you have a nice trip? Yep, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the only way to travel, believe me. Ah, it's wonderful what's being done nowadays. Only took me two days to come from Watch Bar. Two days? To hear that? Yeah, yes, indeed. Hey, isn't that uh, George Wilkins coming along there? I believe it is. Well, he's certainly in a hurry. Sergeant Preston. I, I've been looking all over for you. What is it, George? You look as if you'd seen a ghost. Yeah, I wish it had been a ghost. Mose Andrews has been killed. <laughs> killed? Mose Andrews? Where? Right beside the railroad tracks on the other side of the lake. I just came from there. How? Shot. Right through the heart. And Sergeant. Yes? And Duncan's scarf was caught under him. Duncan? Why? And I didn't touch anything. I raced my dogs to get over here. Better come and have a look for yourself. I'll be right with you, George. Hey, I mind if I come along, Sergeant? Old Mose was a friend of mine. Oh, come if you like. Hung King! Hung you, Hung King! Down there, right by the tracks. Oh, Hung King! Hung you, Hung King! See? I didn't touch him. All I did was to make sure... Well, I I mean... I thought he might have passed out or something. You can see Duncan's scarf. Yes. And he hasn't been dead long. How can you tell? His body's just beginning to get cold. I'd say you found him shortly after the murder, George. Gee. If I'd have come along sooner, I might have saved his life. Or lost your own. Mm, Looks like Duncan did it all right. But why would he... Help me lift old Mose here, boys. Yeah, sure. I hoped old Mose walk away from many a fight. Never expected to. I know what you mean, Lance. Yeah, that's it. It don't make much difference whether we handle him easy or not. Somehow I just can't believe it. There. Now to get back to train junction. All right, King. Get the dogs up, fella. <laughs> King, are you Lance and George went back to train junction on snowshoes. It was a strange funeral procession for the old miner, Mose Andrews, that filed its way into town. Well, I guess you'll want to see Dan. Yes. Well, Lance and me will take care of the body then. Mose didn't have any family. That's a good idea. Uh, we'll see you in. Say, here comes Dan. Yeah, he's a cool one. Look, he's coming right over to us as if nothing had happened. But I heard you say you were leaving train junction, Sergeant Preston. I won't be for quite a while now, Dan. Why don't you come out to the gap? What happened to Mose? You know what happened to him. Why, what do you mean? Mose was found out near the railroad tracks on the far side of Lake Skillet. A bullet through his heart. Oh. Yes. What's more, it was your scarf that was found pinned under him. How well, not... I've seen some mighty cool ones in my day, but never. It won't anybody... do you much good denying it, Dan. Denying what? I don't know what you're talking about. You mean I that... mean I don't know what you're getting at. My scarf was found beside Mose. I didn't put it there. Well, maybe he didn't put it there, but you might have well, dropped wait it. Wait a minute, boys. Wait a minute. Dan, where have you been for the last three hours? Why in my cabin, Sergeant. Anybody with you? No. No, sir. Kind of strange you weren't spending your time at the cafe like you usually do. I... I don't know what this is all about. Well, it looks like you're suspected of murder, Dan. Murder? You mean you think I... I didn't say I thought so, Dan. It's only that all the evidence we have, and that's a scarf, points to you. I wasn't near the railroad, I tell you. I've been in my cabin. You can't prove it. I give you my word. It seems to me one man's word ain't good enough when a murder's been committed. Well, Sergeant... I haven't finished the investigation, Dan. I had no reason to wish Mo's dead. No? What about the argument you had with him? Huh? What argument? I didn't have I heard you and Mose talking last week. And if I ever saw two men having harder words, I don't remember it. I haven't seen Mose for more than a month. You got the wrong man. Saw them just as plain as I see you now, Sergeant. That's a lie. Where was that, Lance? In front of Dan's cabin. 
wasn't another soul in sight, so I figured it was best to let them finish it themselves. Then I never thought it'd come to this. I'm all the yellow line. Yeah, you... you better be careful, Dan. You ain't in a position to be calling names, you know. You ought to be put under arrest. Who knows who will be shooting next? Well, I'm not arresting them yet. They're not? No. Dan, I put you on your honor. If you leave train junction, you know as well as I do, it'll only be another card stacked against you. Gee, Sergeant. You think I'm not anxious to find out who's trying to frame me? You don't have to worry about me leaving town. In the meantime, King and I'll do some investigating. King? My lead dog, yeah. That's none of my business, but I don't think you're taking this seriously enough. You're right, Lance. It isn't any of your business. Well, I'll see you later. All right, King. Get the dogs up. I'm King! I'm your King! Seems to me we ought to take care of old Moe's, Lance. Yeah, yeah. I wonder what he meant. Investigate. I don't know. There sure are a lot of things about this I'd like to know. You? Well, you've as good as got a noose around your neck right now. I've taken as much as I'm going to... Hey, wait a minute. You're on your good behavior, remember, Dan? It's a good thing for this varmint that I am. I'll lend your hand with Moe's, George. And then I'm going to the cabin. I ain't been home for three days. All right. So long, George. I never did like that, fella. Well, what do you aim to put the body on? Meanwhile, Sergeant Preston and King were approaching Skillet Lake. Footprint should still be there. Ho, King. Ho, you huskies. All right now, fella. Yeah, let's see. Hmm. Enough prints here. The thing I don't understand is how, if Dan did commit the murder, he'd do it so stupidly. He'd have planned it more carefully. We might have missed something when we were here before, King. I think... Ah. A set of prints leading to the lake. They go down to the ice. Hmm. Uh-huh. I thought I noticed these before. They're cut just about as deeply as the others. But where'd they come from? <laughs> oh, more of the same prints. But they're deeper. As if the man were carrying something heavy. Yet they begin here. The only sled tracks besides mine and George's are the ones Andrew's sled cut coming in from the north. Could the murderer have been riding with Moe's? King. <laughs> I think I got it. Lance's tracks and the tracks leading down to the lake are identical. Could he have... King, get the dogs up. We're going across the lake. That's it, fellas. To the left. On the king. On the husky. Leading the dogs, King raced across the ice-covered lake. As they reached the bank, the front of the sled runners struck a clean surface. Hold, King! All right, hold, you husband, hold! Well, what is it, fella? Huh? Skis. Ah, just as I thought. The murderer came across the lake on these skis. These footprints lead up to the tracks and then stop. King, I think we've found the man who's tried to frame Dan for a murder he committed. On King! On you huskies! That night, in George McCarthy's cabin at the edge of train junction... Well, I reckon we're all here now. And would you mind telling me just why in the middle of the oh, night... take it easy now, Lance. I only did what the sergeant told me to. You must have a good reason. Mm, he better have. I do have, Lance. <clears throat> what are you doing with those skis, sergeant? Mighty nice looking pair. Well, I asked George to bring all of you together because I want to get your fingerprints. Fingerprints? What's that got to do with... Well, you see, I found these skis on the bank of the lake. They had evidently been pushed under the snow. The wind had blown back the snow, and when King and I crossed the ice, the sled struck them. Meaning? Meaning that the man who murdered Mose Andrews used these skis to cross the lake. Then he pushed them under the snow. He forgot one thing, however. The snow won't erase fingerprints. All right, George, you ready? Sure. What do you want me to do? Uh, put your finger on this pad right here. Like this? Yeah. Well, that's fine. 
Now over on this paper. There. You want my left hand, too? No, the right will be enough. Now, Lance. You ain't fingerprinting me. Why, it's an insult. It's no insult to an innocent man. It's your problem to find a guilty man. That's just what I'm doing. I'm sorry, Lance. You'll... Uh, what? You'll have to be fingerprinted like everyone else. You're wrong. Hey, put that gun away. What the... Line up there against the wall. All of you. So, I was right. You did cross the lake on those skis. Yeah, I crossed all right. On top of the ice. And you're going to be under it inside of 30 minutes. You jumped off the train when it stopped for water. You jumped off at the spot where you killed Mose. All you had to do was stand there and wait for him. Ah, you seem to have all the answers. Go on, Preston. Then what did I do? As the train was pulling out, Andrews came driving in just as you knew he would. The engine made enough noise to cover the shot. So you waited a few minutes. You were lucky because it had begun to get dark. Yeah. Then you went down to the riverbank. You used something for a sail. I don't know what that was. The wind blew you across the lake on these skis here. The train by that time was stopped. It was a simple thing to climb back in your window and get off at the station where I saw you. Right? <laughs> I give you credit. But why would he want to frame me? You uh, got the answer for that, too? Yes, I think I do. Dan, you and Andrews both struck gold. Lance knew neither of you has a family. And this is just as good a way as any to get those claims. You're right, I did want to frame Dan. I figured I could kill two birds with one stone. Yeah, but... Why I've had I... enough talk. A criminal is always caught because he makes a mistake. You've made two of them, Lance. What do you mean? You made your first one when you planted Dan's scarf beside Moe's. You've made your second one by forgetting my helper. Helper? You don't have one, and if you think you can get away with it... Help! 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 Good work, fella. You're the smartest dog I ever seen. You saved our lives. Tie him up, Dan. You bet I will. That's a good thing you found them skis, Sergeant. Yes. They put the story together for me. Why, with his fingerprints on them? I didn't find any fingerprints on them. What? You mean... I mean your own conscience helped to convict you. I knew how you committed the crime. I wanted your admission of your guilt. This was the best way I knew of getting it. Well, I'll be... Yes, King. The case is closed. Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, brought to you every Saturday at this same time, originated in the transcription studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bob Height speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. On King! On you, Husky! King, the swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region, and the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. On the trail from Stovepipe, a group of high rocks concealed the entrance to a deep cave. Ho! Oh, ho, you Malamutes! Well, after we get these furs into the cave, I'll shove back to the city. Yeah. The boss will send someone along to pick them up. Yeah. <coughs> Well, it's a quicker way to get rich than working with a pick. <laughs> Listen, I've seen more gold in these last two years than a miner's written over his claim. None of that stuff for me. Yep. Slim pays off all right, but it'd be a bad man to cross. There's only one answer to that one, Brent. You're smart, you don't cross him. Yep. Remember what happened to Lefty? I never did hear that story straight. <laughs> Got some more furs in the sled. Yeah. Last I heard was he got hung for Pop Johnson's murder. <laughs> well, if you didn't have no more to do with Pop Johnson's murder than you had. Huh? Here, you dropped a beaver pelt. Yeah, I'll put it on top. Uh, this is the last of the batch. Who oh, say? All anybody knows, Lefty thought he was getting too big for the gang. Yeah? He was all set to strike out on his own, pull a couple of jobs and leave the Yukon. What happened? All I know is the body got it from murder and he swung a week later. <laughs> 
I heard he was able to talk. How come he got hung so soon after he was caught? Yeah, that's a funny part of it. Two or three hours after someone brought Slim the news and Lefty was going to rat on him to save his head, Lefty was found in his cell. Hanging? Nobody knows to this day how it happened. Not even the mighty that put the handcuffs on him. And nobody had the keys to the who's guy. They had to get in somewhere. The only one's got the answer to that is Slim. And he don't say much. Yeah, right there. Well, our job's done. Yeah, I'll ride back to Stove. You stay here till one of the boys comes to pick up his load. He ought to be along, sir. Who'd have long to wait? I'll get some. Hey. What's wrong? Look. Out there on the trail. Maybe one of the boys. Not riding that trail, it ain't. We come from the north if it was. Better get out of here. Wait a minute. Maybe we can get behind these rocks. It's a Maori. He must have followed the tracks. Get your gun, Mac. Don't worry, I'm ready. And let him have it. Make a run for the rocks, King. He spotted us. That was too close. I'm going to make a break for it. Hey, what do you mean? How am I going to... I'll get the slim. He'll take care of you. Cover me, do you hear? Watch you, mother. No. Come on, King. I'm hurt. My shoulder. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Oh, that's not a bad wound. King, bring me my kit. Where, where are you taking me, Monty? That's it, fella. All right, back to stovepipe. As soon as we get this fixed up. And I want to look inside that cave. Oh, oh, Easy there. And I wouldn't reach for that gun. King's keeping a close eye on him. No? Here you Say, I'll go along, piece of Sorry. Now, King, you watch him while I go inside the cave. You won't be calling the cars along, Marty. Is this your hideout? <laughs> With all the answers you got, how come that one ain't in your book? His partner wouldn't have hit the trail so quickly. Well, stolen pelts. Every last one of them. Marked with a K. And these are Dan Kelly skins. They must have just stored them here. Stovepipe boasted one of the few newspapers in the North. Edited by Jim Armstrong, the language of its editorials was often more strong than correct, but it was geared to the needs of the men who read it and crusaded always for law, order, and justice in the Yukon. Sergeant Preston and his prisoner rode into stovepipe just as oil lamps were being lighted. Oh, King! Oh, you husband! All right, Mac, come on. What's your hurry, Monty? I want to ask you some questions. <laughs> questions usually got to have answers. Hey there, Sergeant Preston. Well, hello, Jim. How is everything at the Clarion? Quiet. Too quiet. Well, who's your prisoner? Mac Wiley. Yeah? What are you jailing for? Stealing ferns. Stealing furs, eh? Who's? Dan Kelly's, as far as I know now. All right, in there, Mac. You can take these handcuffs off now, can't you? Yes, I suppose so. Say, you sounded like you thought there was more behind this than meets the eye, Sergeant. Yes, I think there is. Yeah, mind if I stay around a while? <laughs> Always the newspaper man, huh, Jim? Shucks, got to print something or the boys will run me out of town. No chance of them running you out of town. But stay if you like. You might find it interesting. I wouldn't count on that, Monty. Yeah. <sighs> Say. I ain't answering any questions, see? You can keep me locked up here for any charges you think of. You mean you'll serve a jail sentence before you... This don't make sense. Maybe it does make sense. What are you afraid of? Your partner won't be able to get you out. I ain't talking. It might go easier with you. Listen. To... I ain't signing my own death warrant. What kind of a fool do you think I am? Think I want to be found hanging from the ceiling in the morning? Not me. Hanging from the... You heard me. Go on. Ask me anything you want. <laughs> if you like talking to yourself. You mean Lefty Watson? Well, that looked like suicide. You Monty's ain't so smart. Lefty committing suicide. That's a laugh. The boss got... I ain't saying anymore. Who is the boss? No one could have hung Lefty. <laughs> All night long, 
Preston and Jim Armstrong fired questions at the outlaw. But after his one slip, mentioning the boss, Mac refused to say more. As the hours wore on, the light flickered on his tired, lined face, but his resolution was not to be shaken. A few hours before daybreak, the sergeant and Jim left him. I'd say that was a mighty scared man. Yes, indeed. Boss. You know, Jim, I have a hunch this is the gang behind most of the robberies in this part of the north. Robberies and murders? They've been stealing gold and furs for a long time now. If we could get Wiley to tell us what he knows... There might be a way to reach him. What do you mean? Listen, Jim. Do just as I tell you. The next morning, as Sergeant Preston sat behind his desk in the jail... Well, you're up early, Jim. Yeah, had to get the paper out. Brought you over a copy. Oh, thanks. I'm releasing my prisoner this morning. Releasing him? Yes, lack of evidence. All right, Mac. You mean I'm free? Yes. But let me give you one tip. If I catch up with you again, you'll stay behind bars a long time. Ah. So long, Mr. Editor. Oh, we'll be seeing more of each other. You see the clarion yet? I never read any papers. Besides, I'm in a hurry. You made the news this time. Yeah, well, you... What? Sure. Read it. Captured by Sergeant Preston, Mac Wiley told this writer and the sergeant of the leader of a gang... Hey. Makes good news, don't it? I didn't say anything. Well, if I told him the truth, wouldn't be nothing exciting there. I'll say escape from jail in the next one. Hey, Monty, you can't let him do this to me. Jim Prince, what he wants to. Sure. Ain't you ever heard of freedom of the press? <laughs> no, I guess you wouldn't have. I didn't talk. I didn't. Now this, this says I did. He won't believe me. He won't have a chance, I tell you. You're a free man. Go on out and square it with your gang yourself. No, oh, I can't. They'd shoot me on sight. Monty, lock me up. Lock you up? Mac, I just told you. Yeah, free. yeah, I know. But you gotta, you gotta lock me up. I tell you, they'll kill me if you don't. They might even... Uh, I'm done for, I guess. That's all your fault. You've done this. Now, wait a minute. There might be a way out of this for you. What? Give me the names of the men in the gang. I can almost call their list of crimes. But I need your help, Mac. And captured, they can't do you any harm. <laughs> captured? You'd like that, wouldn't you, Monty? A nice feather in your hat. Besides, they'd get me anyway. Well, if that's the way you want it. I don't want it anyway. You got me into this, Preston. You got to help me out. I can't do anything, Mac. Without evidence, my hands are tied. How fast will that paper get around? Oh, don't have enough copies for everybody. One man passes his along to the next fellow. What if I... If I give you the evidence you want? If you do that, the whole gang will be behind bars by sundown. Well, I guess there ain't anything else to do. Huh. One way or the other, I can't win. You'll find Slim at the cabin, three miles west of Skeleton Creek. Following Mac's directions, Sergeant Preston and Jim headed for the hideout, the great dog king breaking tracks through the snow. With the advantage of surprise, they prepared to take a stand against six desperate men. The sun had already gone down behind a line of somber pine trees as the Monty pulled his sled into the protection of a group of rocks. We'll leave the dogs here, huh? I think if we go from here on snowshoes, it'll be better. You're right. You suppose he got someone on guard? Hard to tell from here. All I can make out is a cabin. But by keeping in the shadow of those pine trees, we should be safe enough. All right, King, old boy. Come on. <laughs> To the back of the cabin. Max said there's a door there. What if he was lying? The violent might have We've been coming this far, Jim. And so to the back of the small cabin, the two men crept. The great dog King soundlessly hugging his master's footsteps, every muscle tense, ready for the conflict to come. The outlaws, feeling secure, had long since forgotten to bolt the wood door the two men now silently faced. The Mountie pushed it quietly. And to Jim's astonishment, it swung on its hinges. 
They entered a darkened room, shutting the door behind them. They're all in the next room. They ain't... Oh! What's that? What's that room? Well, come in with your hands up, whoever you are. We're coming in, all right. But not with our hands up. That's two out, Adam King. Get away, Get away. All right. All right. All right, King. Good work, fella. Better handcuff the lot of them, Jim. You ain't got nothing on us. That's right. That's wrong. I've got all the evidence against you I need, Slim. <laughs> yeah? Yes. We persuaded Mac Wiley to give us a few details we didn't have. Mac? Wait till the boys see the paper I roll out when we get back to Stovepipe. <laughs> I gotta hand it to you, Sergeant. It was a mighty smart trick faking that copy of the Clarion. Without you and King here to help, these boys might still be free, Jim. All right. You might tell your men, Slim, that they have a long trip in front of them. A one-way trip. You heard the Sergeant. Get going. <laughs> Yes, King. The case is closed. Upholding the motto of the Northwest Mounted Police, Sergeant Preston and the Great Dog King maintain the right and get their man. Don't miss their next thrilling adventure when they meet the challenge of the Yukon once again on Saturday at 6.30. On King! On you husky! <laughs> challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, Brought to you every Saturday at this time, originated in the transcription studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bill Morgan speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> On King! On you husky! <laughs> King, the swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region, and the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. Tom Wayne and his sister Mary live several miles north of Harper City. Inside their cabin, three people faced each other, their voices sharp and tense. You can save your breath, my lord. I'm not selling out. Tom, I don't know what you've got against me. <laughs> Never done you any harm. Forget it. I think you're making a mistake, Tom. I'll make that 30000 Tell you I'm not interested at any price. If you weren't so stubborn, Tom Wayne, you'd see Bert's trying to do you a favor. I wouldn't put it that way. Of course, I wouldn't make every man an offer like that. Oh, Bert, I know you're just... He's just trying to buy out one of the richest loads in the Yukon before we get a chance to turn over the gold. He's not doing anyone a favor except himself. Tom. You haven't found a nugget in the mine since you bought it. There's no sign gold isn't there. Suit yourself, Tom. You don't have to worry on that, Count Malloy. I aim to. But right now, I think I'll go outside. At least I won't see any skunks and shoes out there. Well. You mustn't take Tom too seriously, Bert. <laughs> Certainly doesn't think much of me. Oh, that's just Tom's way. Why, there's no more loyal friend on this earth than Tom. If he likes you. And he doesn't like me. He doesn't know you. That's why he feels as he does. Well, I don't care how he feels about me, Mary. As long as you don't feel the same way. Oh. You know very well I wouldn't take your part against Tom's for one minute. If I didn't believe in you. I know. It makes me feel like the luckiest man in the world. Oh, if only your brother... Oh, well. No. Oh. Now, don't let that worry you, Bert. I'll talk to Tom tonight and try to persuade him differently. Will you? Yes. 
Then perhaps I'd better tell him about us. No, no, you let me do that. He, he, he won't get as excited if I tell him. Well, in that case, I'll head for the city and see you tomorrow. Uh, if I may. You'll stay out of the cafe, Bert. Listen, Mary. I gave you my word, didn't I? From now on, I'm taking orders from you. Good night. Good night, Bert. <laughs> Late that night, as Mary cleaned the supper dishes from the table, Tom reached for his pipe. Supper had been a quiet meal. The strong feeling Tom expressed against Bert Malloy separated them as completely as a wall. Tom. Huh? Tom, I, I want to talk to you. Yes, I, I guess I want to talk to you, too. Oh, your pipe. Watch those ashes. Oh, forgot. Sorry. Why don't you like Bert? Listen... When you see a mountain lion coming up to your door, you don't open it up to let him in, do you? I feel the same way about that no good low-down gambler. But he's changed. Not Bert Malloy. Does a leopard change his spots? I tell you, he's known in every gambling hall in the Yukon for a yellow crooked polecat. Tom, I'm going to marry Bert. And another thing, I... What'd you say? I said I'm going to marry him. Mary. I mean it. I... Oh, I wish for my sake you'd forget whatever you have against him. He's changed. I can't believe it. You can't be serious. Well, let's not quarrel about it. My sister married to Bert Malloy. I can hear it already. Every tongue in all the cafes this side of Skagway will be wagging with the news. Oh, Mary... In Harper City, Slim's Cafe attracted every thirsty miner in town. The men gathered around the pot-bellied stove at the far end of the room and exchanged stories and gossip, commenting on the ways of the rest of the Yukon. Yes, sir. I says Ted when he told me. I says, you don't mean it. I can't understand what a girl like Mary Wayne is seeing that scum. Uh, he ain't ever minded to a row bean. Bert Malloy must have changed a lot since I saw him last. To him? <laughs> he ain't changed. He ain't like me, did Wonder what Tom thinks about it. I don't know. I'm surprised he ain't Phil Malloy full of lead. You never did like him. Oh, say, here comes Sergeant Preston. What's come down for a while, Sergeant? Oh, I just came in to see you boys for a while. Oh, did you hear about Mary Wayne planning to marry Bert Malloy? Mary Wayne? Yep. So he's hard to believe, ain't it? Are you sure that's him? Oh, well, yes, any of the fellows here. It's all a mistake. Anybody wants my opinion. Hmm. I was just planning to drop out to see Mary and Tom. Here's like you better get out there then, Monty, and try to talk some sense into the girl. Ah, uh, you know how a woman is, Heb, once she gets an idea in her head. Oh, I don't know. Maybe Mary would listen to the sergeant now. Well, at least I can go out and see how much truth there is to it. I certainly hope you boys are wrong. Well, hope for Mary's sake we are too, but I don't know. If you hear anything about it, let us know. <laughs> A short time later, on the trail toward Tom Wayne's cabin. Yeah? So what do you want me to do about it? I'm going to marry Mary Wayne. So I heard. And then with Tom Wayne out of the way, I'll own the watch Bob mine. Uh, say, now I see what you mean. <laughs> I should have known you're too smart to be serious about anything. But get this, Red. I want whatever happens to him to look like an accident. That mine will be a strike any day now. And I'm going to be the man to turn over the gold. How will I know when to get him? Yeah, that's your problem. Watch your chance, and then take it. Mush, you huskies! Mush! <laughs> Farther ahead on the trail, Sergeant Preston sighted the Wayne cabin. All right, King. Oh, oh, you must be Sergeant Preston. Tom. Well, I'm glad to see you. No flatter than I am to see you. Seems like a long time since you've been in these parts. Too long, Tom. But then I can't call around as often as I'd like to. Well, Sergeant Preston, 
How nice to see you. Just stop by to say hello, Mary. How are you? Just fine. Glad to hear it. Sure you didn't stop by to try to stop me marrying Bert Malloy? Oh, I'm sorry. But everyone is so against it. I almost imagine Tom sent for you to try to talk me out of it. No, Mary. I won't say a thing about it. Oh, I don't know. I wouldn't ask the sergeant here to do something I can't do myself. Uh, how is the watch fob working out, Tom? Say, I want you to see the watch fob. I tell you, that mine's going to turn up the richest strike in this part of the country in a few days. <laughs> yes, sir. I want you to see it right now. All right. That mine's Tom's baby, sergeant. You bet it is. Ready? Yes, indeed. I'll see you in a few minutes. Don't be too long. We won't. If she marries that varmint, he'll break her heart. And I can't stop her. You may be going about this in the wrong way. What do you mean? Mary is a headstrong girl. You can't railroad her out of a thing once she's made up her mind. You should try to expose Bert to her. Make her see him as he really is. You think so? Well, maybe you're right. Over this way a bit. This is the entrance. Well, you've got quite a bit of rock pile up here. I'm all ready to go ahead now into the real gold. You look as pleased as a boy with a new present. This means a lot to me. Now, over here. I'm going to blast through here, and that'll get... Tom! Tom, look out! Hey! Wow. You're almost pinned beneath those rocks. Hmm. can't understand that. Unless those rocks have been there, none of them ever loosened. Unless? Unless... Uh, never mind. I was just thinking. Those things will happen, I guess. Maybe we'd better go back up to the cabin. It's a good idea. Well, whose sled is that? Where? Oh. Malloy again. I wonder how long he's been here. I don't relish a talk with him. We might as well get it over with. Hello, Preston. Hello, Bert. Oh, you look as if you just... As if I just what? Uh, nothing. What do you know about those rocks falling? Tom, now don't start a fight in here. What rocks? I don't know what you're talking about. Just because you don't like me, Tom, you needn't think I'm here for trouble. I, uh, think I'll be going back to town. So soon? Yeah. You coming outside with me, Tom? Huh? Oh, sure. Uh, so long, Bye, Sergeant. Sir. Tom, now listen to me. I think this may be your chance to call Malloy's cards. You do as I tell you. Say, I'll do that. I'll go back inside now. I'm going back down to the mine, Mary. Getting dark. Yes, I know. And I have some blasting to do. It's pretty dangerous, and I'll feel better if it's finished up. Need any help? No, thanks. Easy enough for an accident to happen with one man handling the job. I won't be long, Mary. Uh, Mary, I have something out on the sled I've been meaning to give you on. Wait a minute. Oh, how nice. I'll wait right here. Red. Yeah? Get down to the mine. You muffed one chance to get Wayne. Now this time, see that there are no slip-ups. He's going to be blasting. Get him from behind, then set off the charge. <laughs> You'll never know what hit him. Stealthily, Red crept through the mine entrance. He saw Tom Wayne bending over a dynamite charge near a pile of rocks. With gun in hand, Red edged closer. Hey, what are you doing here? Put up your hands, Wayne. Put up a... What is this, a holder? No, not a hold up, a blow up. <clears throat> You're going up with that dynamite and nobody will ever know it wasn't an accident. Nobody? You're wrong. Drop that gun, Red. Preston. Yes. Yeah. You seem surprised. I didn't have nothing to do with it. It wasn't my idea. Honest, it wasn't. And whose idea was it to get me out of the way? Bert's. He wants to mine. It's the truth, I tell you. Honest, it is. Come on, Tom. We'll face Bert with Red here. And a charge for attempted manslaughter. I think I hear 
someone coming. It must be Tom. I'll... Well, it might be. Tom. No surprise, my lord. You're not half as surprised as you're going to be. Keep those hands up, Red. Red? How... Well, what happened? I... I don't understand. Who is this man? Bert here can answer that one. Well, speak up, Malloy. There's nothing to say. I never saw this man before. You ain't throwing the blame for this on me. What do you mean you never saw me before? Why? Easy, Red. That's not the story we heard. You're not holding any gun on me. I'll show you. Don't let him get the gun. I already got it. Now, you listen to me. Sure, I wanted Wayne out of the way. And this time, there won't be any slip-ups. Go on, get over against the wall. All of you. Bird. You two, get over there. Not so fast. Get him, King. All right, King. That's enough, boy. I have the gun. Yes, sir. Always did say. Smartest dog in the Yukon. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I'm sorry, Mary. But it's better to have found out now. Tom will tell you the story of what happened. King and I have a job to do. Taking these two prisoners to Harper City in jail. Yes, King. The case is closed. Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, brought to you every Saturday at this time, originated in the transcription studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bill Morgan speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> King, the swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region and the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. Darkness was punctuated by the light of a bobbing lantern as old man Higgins made a tour of his trap lines. Since his ermine pelts netted him more than any other trapper in the North... This idiosyncrasy of carrying a light came to be accepted, and Higgins and his lantern were as well known in watch fob as the cluster of rocks he rounded nightly. The old man walked with a limp. The light he swung at his side, falling at intervals on a greasy old Mackinac and a matted gray beard. He approached the rock formation, a temporary protection against the piercing wind, when suddenly from the darkness in front of him, he stumbled, fell, his face twisting for a moment his eyes straining to see the man who had fired from the darkness. The lantern flickered and burned through the night. But I tell you, I saw it myself. Ah, You're daft, Pete. Right on top of the rocks. That lantern was burning as bright as the one old man Higgins used to carry. That was six months ago. Well, what's the difference? Six months ago, a year. It's there. I tell you, that light was on top of them rocks. If you ask me, it's the spirit of Higgins looking for the man that murdered him. Ride past Lantern Rock at night? Not me. Yeah, but Sam, I gotta get these first to my shitty. That don't mean a thing to me. When I ride my sled, I'm riding alone. Not with any ghost dog in my trail. I'll give you a hundred dollars if you make that trip. No, sir. There ain't a soul on two feet will make that trip except in daylight. I wouldn't do it for a thousand dollars. And so the story grew until it became almost a legend. Strong men, miners toughened by years in the heart of the North, who knew the bitterness of disappointment and the exultation of seeking and finding gold, they gathered in cafes and spoke of what they saw in hushed voices. Two years passed, and in the Purple Fan Cafe, early in the afternoon... Say, ain't that Dave Watson? I believe you're right. 
It sure has changed. Looks like a man that's down on his luck. Mick Black would be glad to see him. Seems Dave saved his life once while they were prospecting together. Now. Dave! Uh, Dave Watson! Yeah. Uh, by golly, it's good to see you. How you been? Fine, Pete. How about you? Oh, can't complain. Well, what do you have? It's on me. Oh, the old special's good enough for me. Right. Two specials, Red. Uh, seen Miff yet? No. No, I just got in, to tell the truth. I hear he has a pretty nice strike out near Landon Rock. Yep, that's so. Of course, he ain't never been able to get anyone to help him any out there. That is, except that fella he called Shorty. <laughs> yeah, with them lights appearing on the rock, there ain't a man this side of Juno will be around the place two hours at a stretch. Oh, Preston. Oh, he'll be mighty pleased to see you. Hey, Sergeant. Hello there, Pete. Hey. Hello, Sergeant. Well, this is a surprise. What brings you back to watch, Bob, after all this time? Oh, I came back to see Miff. I, uh... Well, I ain't had much luck lately, so I figured maybe I could help him out for a space. Well, he always said have what he had was yours, Dave, after that accident. That looks like your drinks, boys. Yeah, I know better than to ask you to have a drink, Sergeant. So, here's to you, Dave. Thanks, Pete. I'm going out to Miff's place myself. We are? I'll take you out with me whenever you're ready to leave. Well, that's right now, then. A short time later, as Sergeant Preston and Dave walked from the sled to Miff's cabin. Did you let Miff know you were coming? No, I, I didn't. Thought I'd surprise him. You probably will. He's got a nice place here. Yes, he... No, I think he's coming. Sergeant Preston, what brings you here? Hello, Miff. Well, uh, but... Dave, where in the world did you come from? You're not going to let us stand out here, are you? Oh, I was so surprised. <laughs> Why, sure, come on in. Well, I haven't seen Dave for six years. Yeah, it's been a long time. Some place you got here. Oh, it's all right. Here, sit down. Where are you heading for? Dave's come to help you. Yeah, I thought oh, I'd... Well, you're welcome to stay around. You know that, Dave. Well, thanks. Thanks, Miff. I was hoping you'd say that. You see, I struck a streak of hard lux. It's just about done me in. Whatever I can do for you, I will. But say, how come you're in these parts, Sergeant? Well, as a matter of fact, Miff, I was coming out to see you anyway when I bumped into Dave at the Purple Fan. Oh, what do you got on your mind? Robberies, gold and fur. Robberies? Well, there have been a lot of them lately, and I have a hunch the gang is operating from around here. Well, what makes you think so? Well, I've eliminated every other possibility. Your own gold may be in danger, Miff. Oh, I haven't noticed any. Surely you've heard about it. No. No, I've been sticking pretty close to the cabin. I don't get into town much, but maybe one of the boys would know something. Uh, I hoped you might know something about them. I'm sorry, I can't help you. Well, that is, unless you'd call some funny things have been happening around here lately. Part of a setup or something. Shorty! Hey, Shorty! Yeah? Come here. I want you to meet a friend of mine. Shorty, this is Dave Watson. Please meet you. How are you? You know Sergeant Preston. Yeah, sure. I know the money. What did you mean, Miff? Funny things happening. Oh, nothing that I can put my finger on. I'm thinking of giving up this business. Giving up the business? Yeah. <laughs> Ain't said nothing about You've it. You've got a good strike here, haven't you? Oh, I got enough gold. Suppose you tell us. Well, for a long time, other fellas have been telling stories about a lantern on the rocks yonder. I never thought much about it, but I'm beginning to see it myself lately. You've checked for footprints? Oh, ain't never any around. I don't know. Now, it's my own opinion. No human hand sets it there. You're not a man to believe in ghosts. It's probably no more than the reflection of the moon. Maybe so. Late that night, after Sergeant Preston had turned his team back toward Watch Bob, and Dave Watson had gone to bed, Miff beckoned to Shorty Williams, who followed him out of the cabin. Oh, Maybe you'll tell me what this is all about. What's eating you, Miff? What's this guy staying out here for? You going down? I'll take it easy. Listen, Shorty, Preston suspects that gang stealing golden furs is staked in these parts. That don't mean nothing to us. As long as he don't suspect... Shut up and listen to me. You know as well as I do, we can't have anyone hang around here long. Dave don't see any mining going on. He's going to wonder where our gold comes from. Maybe that lantern will scare him away. Why don't you just tell him to leave? I can't do that. Don't you understand? 
I made a bargain with him six years ago. I said that half of what's mine was his when he saved me from that landslide. But six years is a long time ago. A long time. In Watch Fob, a week later... Sergeant Preston walked into the Purple Fan Cafe. Hey, hiya, Sergeant. Dave Watson's looking for you. Where is he, Slim? Oh, I see him. Thanks. Hello, Dave. Slim said you were looking for me. Yes, Sergeant. How are you? Fine. What brings you to town? I thought you were... Oh, I'm in to get supplies, but I want to talk to you. Let's go over here, then. Sit down. All right. Sergeant, I won't waste any time. I heard Miss struck gold. Well, yes, he's supposed to have one of the... Well, that's just it. I've been mining gold most of my life, pulling it out of cricks and blasting it out of rock. But what I want to know is this. If a man's doing hard rock mining, how come he gets coal dust? Well, I don't know. Well, I'm up there blasting away, and I ain't hit no gold. But Miff, he's got enough dust to lay the floor. Hmm. Did he say where he got the dust? Sure, he says he got it out of his claim. I think King and I'll have to look into this, Dave. Don't tell Miff you were talking to me. Investigating Dave's story, Sergeant Preston and King came upon the lantern burning brightly on top of the rocks that night. His curiosity aroused, the Mountie looked for footprints, but found none. Instead, he discovered a tunnel behind the rocks... The next day, talking to Dave... Well, Dave, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to leave... That night in Miff's cabin, while Dave was out getting wood... Well, I... I got it set up again. Well, that lantern on them rocks has thrown a heap of fear into a lot of men. I, uh... Hope it throws some into him. Hey, Mip. That lantern out on the rocks. Yeah? It's moving. What? Moving? That's right. Let me see. Hey. It it is moving. Yeah. You're here? I'm here. But there it is out there. Moving around. It ain't human. Next morning, as soon as there was light enough to see, Shorty was out at the rock, covering the ground carefully. Returning to the cabin... Did you find any tracks? Only some wolf tracks. Oh, no wolves carrying a light. Miff, I, I'm through. What do you mean, through? You're not going to let this... Go. I faced a lot of things in my life. I killed a lot of men. But when that lantern starts moving I'll around... Wait till the If it happens tonight, we'll take our guns. <laughs> Shorty paced the floor restlessly as darkness settled over the Yukon. Urged by Miff to set the lantern out, he flatly refused to leave the cabin, when suddenly Dave pointed to the light, bobbing along. Come on, Shorty. I'm going to have a look at that. Go, go out there? Not me. Well, you got your gun. Gun? What good's a gun against something that don't even leave footprints? I'll go out. You you will. Well, all right, Dave. Go on. Uh, here's a gun in case you need it. I'll be back in a few minutes. Ah, you, you oughtn't to let him go. Why not? I can't see nothing out of this window. That light keep... Hey. It's coming this way. No. No! Oh, it's gone. Dave? Where's Dave? Maybe you've got him. Oh, you're talking like he was crazy. Dave! Dave! I saw it. I saw it. What'd you see? Come on in here. What was it? Now, come on, speak up. You look like you've seen a ghost. Ghost. That's it. Holding the light like he was looking for something. What did it look like? A little shorter than Miff. Old, no, an old man. And he walked with a limp. I could make that out. Because Lantern had swing a bit. As he started towards me, I, I got a look at the face. Yeah? Go on. Well, he had a beard, a gray one. But his Mackinac had a patch of red on it right over the heart. Like he'd been shot or something. Shot? And I pulled the gun you gave me, Miff. 
And he just kind of disappeared. Oh, man, Higgins. No, no, it couldn't be. I shot him dead with my own gun. And now... Yeah, I... And that must have been the blood. But we should have done it. He wasn't even carrying a gun. Shut up. You got your share of them pelts, didn't you? Share? What good's a share when I'll be haunted for the rest of my life? It's Higgins looking for the man that shot him. Looking for me. Well, you killed men before. Stealing, killing, but never... Hey, what's that? I thought so. So you're both behind those robberies and murders. Press the nose. Put up your hands. It was a nice job, Dave. And as for King here, well, he's the best lantern carrier I've ever had. Lantern? Yes. King's been carrying that lantern these last two nights, Shorty. I kept him head in the tunnel Sergeant Preston found behind the rocks. No, it was a trick. You mean Higgins wasn't... Dead men don't walk, Shorty. I arrest both of you. You'll hang for the crimes you've committed. Yes, King, with your help, another case is closed. Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, brought to you every Saturday at this time, originated in the transcription studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bill Morgan speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> On King! On you Husky! <laughs> King, the swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region, and the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. <laughs> Shortly after daybreak, two men stood watching a distant sled and dog team break tracks through the snow. Hidden from view behind two huge rocks, they waited, eyes cold with greed and watchfulness. See, I told you it wouldn't be long after daybreak. Yeah, you're right. I gotta hand it to you, Bert. You sure had this one studied out. <laughs> the old man carrying that haul of dust, you think I'd take any chances? That's why we've been lucky. When you take time to plan, there aren't any mistakes. I ain't worrying none about the mistakes. All I care about is get my hands on as much gold that's mine for the taking. Uh, you just be careful how you take it. As long as you stick with me, you won't have to worry about that noose waiting to drop over your head. I ain't complaining. You can fill a poke faster this way than peddling beaver skins. How much do you calculate he's carrying? Plenty. Thomas has been making this trip to the bank for a long time. <laughs> Surprised nobody thought of this before. Uh, got your gun ready? Huh? Oh, sure. Uh, you can make him out pretty plain now. Wait till it gets past the rocks. You're taking a chance of him getting away, ain't you? Not if we shoot fast enough. We'll never know what hit him. All right. You're calling the cards. Your sister suspect anything? Muriel? <laughs> no. Now, remember what I said. Wait till he gets past the rocks. I heard you. You ain't got far to mush, old timer. See that gun on top of the sled? You want to get him before he has a chance to use it. Come on, mush! All right, Slim, let him have it. That dust and we'll clear out of here. I don't like the idea of being around dead men too long myself. He's carrying some of it. <laughs> Look at this. Ooh, well. What's that? Well, the old timer's poke. I'll just pocket it for my trouble. 
You got the rest of it? Yeah. And believe me, I ain't ever seen so much dust in one hole in my life. Come on, then. And what about the dogs? Leave them. Traveling with daylight, Sergeant Preston stopped a short time later at Bart Johnson's cabin, several miles north of Higby. It was Bart's sister, Muriel, who explained... Yes, Bart was out early this morning. Does he always uh, make the round of his trap lines so early? Bart? <laughs> Goodness, Sergeant, I never know whether he'll make his rounds early or late. But last night he mentioned he'd be gone before I'd have breakfast ready. I offered to get up early and get it for him, but he said not to bother. And I am anxious for him to come back. Why? Well, you see, today's Bart's birthday. No one pays much attention to birthdays up here in the Yukon, but oh, I'm going to be married soon. Bart and I won't be together much longer, and oh, here it is. I wanted to have this ring. Say, that's a real present. Bart's always liked it, so I thought I'd surprise him. Hope it fits. <coughs> <laughs> King likes it, doesn't he, Sergeant? <laughs> Quiet, King. It isn't that I'm not delighted to see you, Sergeant, but I can't help wondering what brings you and King to our part of the Yukon. I guess you might say the line of duty brings me here, Muriel. Oh? Isn't that Bart coming now? I thought I saw him. You're right, it is Bart. Muriel, I uh... Hello, Bart. Preston. Well, <laughs> I'm a little surprised to see you here. I just thought I'd stop by. Bart, I think you've forgotten something. You forgotten something? Yes. It's your birthday. Oh. <laughs> I don't keep track of them. Your sister does. Uh-huh. And I have a present for you. Oh, wait till I take up. Why, it's a... a... ring is a rare present in the North. Put it on. It might not fit, you know. All right. There. Hey, got it on, but I'll never get it off again. Is it too tight? Well, tight enough that you won't be able to change your mind and want it back. Oh. <laughs> Where are you going, Monty? Old King and I will be getting along. Won't you stay? <laughs> Bird. What's that that fell out of your parka? It looks like a poke, an initial. What? Swim asked me to take it into Higby for him. <laughs> Sorry you're leaving, Preston. Yes. Well, uh, goodbye, Muriel. Goodbye, Sergeant. Come back again. I expect to. Goodbye. Bye. All right, King, get the dogs up. <coughs> On, King! <coughs> On, you husky! <laughs> As the great dog king led the Mounties dog team, Preston's thoughts dwelt on Muriel and her brother Bart. I'm sure he's tied up with those gold robberies. How to prove it? And Muriel. I'll be glad when that girl marries and has someone else to look after. What's wrong, king? What is it, boy? Ho! Oh, oh, Ho, you husky! You lead the way, fella. Oh, nuzzling around in the... Well, that's Ray Thomas' dog team. But where... Ray. Why don't we turn him... Dead. So that's what you wanted me to see, King, huh? Those rocks concealed it. And that was why Bart had the poke initial RT. He's responsible for this. All right, King, I'm coming. There was another fellow. They ran out from behind the rocks, eh? They must have gotten all the gold Ray carried from those claims in the hills. Get the dogs up, King. This is one crime Bart Johnson's going to pay for. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the Johnson cabin, Bart had watched from a window to see what trail Preston would take. Seeing him turn to the right, he knew it would only be an hour before the Mountie would come on Ray Thomas, dead in the snow. He sent Muriel into town for supplies, and as her sled disappeared on the trail, the murderer worked feverishly. He rushed from the cabin to his sled, and driving the dogs mercilessly, fear of capture urging him on, he raced to his partner Slim. Oh, who you, Malibus? Hey, Bart, you're riding like you was... I'll explain you... this to you later. Get your sled and follow me, and hurry. Sure, but where are you going? I told you to explain later. We'll both be dead men if Preston catches us. Preston? Yeah, now will you hurry? <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Slim needed no further urging. The two men, Bart's sled cutting the trail, drove to the edge of Crystal Lake, where, to Slim's amazement, Bart called a halt. What are you going to do now? You're in such a hurry, Shut what up is... and help me turn this sled over. <coughs> there. How about the dogs? Leave them here. I ought to toss this hat. There. I don't get no, it. You will. From here on, we'll ride the gates in your sled. Mush, you Malamutes! Mush! Sergeant Preston did go back to the cabin. Finding it empty, he prepared to leave just as Muriel came up the trail. Sergeant Preston, back so soon? Where is Bart, Muriel? I don't know. He was here when I left. I see. All right, King, come on. Get the dogs up. Leaving again? Yes, I'm looking for Bart, you see. He'll be back. He might be making a round of the trap lines. I don't think so. When I left here on my way to Higby, I was about halfway to town when I found Ray Thomas on the trail. Murdered. Ray hey, Thomas? He'd been murdered and robbed. But I don't that, see what... That, uh, that poop Bart dropped was initial R.T. Oh. I'm sorry, Muriel. <coughs> I'm ready, King. Goodbye. Good... Goodbye, Sergeant. Good luck. On, King! On, you husky! <coughs> <coughs> Approaching Crystal Lake, the Mountie's sharp eyes sighted the overturned sled before the dogs came abreast of it. Ho, oh, King! Ho, oh, you husky! <laughs> That's Bart's sled. And his hat. Mm. Must have been taking the trail fast and then... Oh, King, too bad we haven't eyes to see the bottom of this lake. In Gates City a few days later, the two killers, Bart Johnson and his partner Slim, stood at the bar in the Golden Peacock Cafe. Neither of them were recognizable as the men who had fled the law. To those in the cafe, they were just two strangers. Sure was a good idea, Bart. Disguising ourselves like this. Yeah, I wasn't anxious to feel that rope around my neck. What made you so sure Preston knew it? His eyes, when I dropped that coat, made me as sure as I'll ever be. We found Thomas... Well, that'd be all you'd need. Knew something when he came to the cabin in the first place. Well, <laughs> your own mother wouldn't recognize you and Ned get him. <laughs> hey! Yep? One more here. How about you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Make that two. Right. Tomorrow we'll start for Skagway in the States. And what about your sister? <laughs> I can't be worrying about her. Yep, here you are, strangers. Always wanted to get back to the States. Look, you see that? Yeah. Come on, let's get out of no, here. No, 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 wait a minute. Take it easy. You'll never know. It's just staying like you are. Well, Red, how's business? Well, oh, can't complain, Sergeant. How you been? Just fine. Say, I heard about poor Ray. Yes. Shot in the back. Never knew what hit him, I guess. Well, somebody made a nice haul. Ray was carrying a heap of dust. Got any idea who done it? I did have, but it, it's too... Uh, what you looking at, Sergeant? That man holding the glass down at the end of the bar. You ever seen him before? No. Them two are strangers, as far as I know. Why? I'm going down there, right? There's a back entrance to the cafe, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, you leaving then? No, I'm not. But those two friends might try to. King, you go to the back entrance and wait there. Better show him where it is, Red. Yeah, sure. Come on, King. Come on, boy. Well, you two boys are strangers in town, aren't you? What difference does that make, Molly? Hmm. Strange. I have a feeling we've met before. You must be thinking of somebody else. Maybe. The man I'm thinking of wore a ring just like that one. Let's see it, stranger. I won this ring in a poker game. Now, if you have no objections, Marty... I'd like to see that ring. Hell with the light, the stone should show... I'm not show. taking it off. So long, mister. Come on, Frank. This isn't so long, Bart. Why, you... Hey, put that gun away, you. I don't want no shooting in here. You heard what he said, Bart. Go back to her, Slim. You won't get out that way. My helper will stop you. <laughs> Your helper. Go on, Slim. 
If anyone here makes a move, it'll be his last one. It wasn't such a smart bluff, Mountie. Yeah, your help. King's teeth are no bluff. Adam King. Stop him, boy. Take that, put him on it. Put a gun on my will you? Let go my arm. He's tearing my arm apart. All right, King. I guess you've had enough, Bart. Stand right where you are, Slim. You win, Mountie. The law always wins. I thought you'd drown when I found your sled by the lake. But that ring on your finger gave you away. Put these handcuffs on them, Red. <laughs> Yes, King. Case is closed. Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, brought to you every Saturday at this time, originated in the transcription studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bill Morgan speaking... This is the Michigan Radio Network. The challenge of the Yukon. On King! On you husky! <laughs> King, the swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region, and the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. <laughs> Trappers and prospectors, the cafe owner, gamblers, the lucky ones, storekeepers, and fur traders. These were the men who crowded the bank at Black Hawk. Two clerks, Dan Snyder and Sam Collins, were taking in dust as Jed Harrow opened his office door. Uh, Dan, Dan, will you come in here a minute, please? Did you hear that? You take care of things, Sam? Sure. I'll just get them all in one line. Go on in. Thanks. Maybe it won't keep me long. Yes, Mr. Harrod? Uh, come on in. Close the door. Uh, sit down. Yeah. Dan, we got bad news. I just got a letter from Iverson. Iverson? Yes. He's coming in to check the books. That is bad. We've got to do something to cover what's gone, Dan. Do it fast. You uh, got any idea what it comes to? About fifteen thousand dollars. It's a lot of money. It sure didn't last long when I look at cards. I thought we'd be able to double it that in no time. Yeah, we doubled all right, but the wrong way. I was talking to two fellows who will be here this afternoon. Yeah, what do they do? Up to now, they've got pretty good records for robbing banks. Robbing banks. That's the only way to cover what we're short. We'll be here this afternoon, eh? That's right. I wanted you to know. When Iverson gets here, you can play dumb, see? Yeah, sure. He certainly wouldn't like knowing his regional manager dipped his fingers into the bank's... Safe. You're in this just as much as I am. So shut up and listen to me. I want you out in front with Sam. He won't suspect anything. <laughs> Late that afternoon, with the threat of snow hanging heavy in the sky, the bank was deserted except for Jed Harrow, seated at his desk behind a closed office door, and the clerks, Sam and Dan. Better get that dust in the safe, Sam. Yeah, I guess so. Sure looks mighty pretty, don't it? Never could figure out why you don't go out and dig for your own instead of writing up everybody else's. Oh, I ain't the lucky kind. Well, I'll put this in the safe, then soon as you're through with them books... We can call it a day. My arm! My arm! What in the... You can't come in here like... You're wrong, mister. We are in. Put up your hand. Wait a minute, Lance. He's got some gold there. Hand it over. Oh, no, you don't. I... You better do as he says, Sam. They but, shot Harrow. But I ain't... All right. Now keep your hands up. Over that safe. I said open it. And you keep your hands up. They're up. 
You'll never get away with this. Your only worry is to turn that combination. You better do it fast. I'll watch him, Lance. You get the gold. Yeah. This is terrible. Masked men, guns, my bank robbed. Yes, yeah, some haul. Come on, hurry. There, I got it all. You got what was in that drawer, didn't you? Yeah. Anyone that steps through that door for the next five minutes stops a bullet, see? Open the door, Pete. Remember, stay where you are. Mr. Hara, you're hurt. Oh, it's nothing. Just my arm. Well, I'll fix it for you, sir. Yes, I am. The door to my office. Go out that way and bring help. Yes, sir. You'll be safe. I won't be able to see you. Here's the kit, sir. Uh, uh, fool. Did they get everything? They swept the place clean. Good. Are you really hurt? Me? <laughs> no. But you better get my arm wrapped up before he gets back with help. Meanwhile, once outside, Sam Collins raced through the streets, spreading the news. The bank! Y- yeah, the bank. the bank! I had my dust in there! So did everybody else! The bank spilled off! Hey, the bank off! Hey, the bank off! Hey, the bank off! Empty before, except for the two clerks and Jed Harrow, the bank now was the focal point of attention as a crowd gathered into the small building. Men who'd lost their savings in the robbery. Others who didn't have dust there, but had friends who did. All of them were there. Jed Harrow, his arm in a sling, was trying to quiet the excited crowd as Sergeant Preston elbowed his way into the room. Hell, man, man! That's how it happened. Sam here can tell you we didn't have a chance. Now, what do you aim to do about it? Well, try to get it back. If we can. What do you mean if you can? I lost $12,000 to them varmints. By golly, I'll follow you them. You do, and you're setting yourself up a sizable job. Sizable job, why, I Take a look get... outside. He's right, Len. With the snow coming down, their tracks will be covered before you even get to your sled. Sergeant Preston. Hey, well, well, I didn't know you were in town. I just got in. What do these men look like? Oh, we couldn't tell. You couldn't tell. They were wearing masks over their hands, and handkerchief over their faces. That's right, Sergeant. We couldn't get a good look at them at all. Only I heard one of them calling the other Lance. They were in and out in about five minutes, Sergeant. There was no one else in the bank? No. Broke in through the door to my office. Door to your office? Yes. When I tried to stop them, one of them took a shot at me. Yes, I see. Hit you in the arm. Yes. What do you mean to do, Sergeant? How could they know about that entrance, Jed? Mind if I take a look at it? Why, no, no. It's over this way. This is your office, eh? Yes. You see, they came in this way here. Mm-hmm. You tried to stop them? They stopped me with a bullet. But you probably won't find much evidence in here. I wouldn't say that, Jed. Sometimes find evidence in unexpected places. Late that night, Sergeant Preston met Will Iverson outside the bank as the banker looked up and down the street, shaken after his session with Jed Harrell. Will! Will Iverson! Yes? Well, Sergeant Preston, this is the first piece of good luck I've had today. How are you? Fine, fine. But I didn't know you were coming to Blackhawk. Why, well, I wrote Jed and told him at the end of the day and tomorrow. Hmm. Strange you didn't mention it. Uh, you... Yes, Jed told me the news. I guess there's nothing to do except pay the miners what they lost and chalk that up to a bad investment. It would have been impossible to follow them once they left the bank, Will. I know. He told me it was snowing. Poor Jed, he's all broken up about it. Did you uh, see his arm? Uh, no. No, I didn't. He's got it in a sling. Can't use it at all. You know, Sergeant, when I gave Jed this job, I was a little doubtful. Oh, I guess I shouldn't say it, but he was kind of wild. Of course, that was a long time ago, and uh, I've always been able to keep a close eye on him, coming back and forth pretty often. But a thing like this, uh, what could he do? The same thing could have happened if if I had been here. I didn't know that. What? That he'd been wild. Oh, yes, but he settled down. How about stopping in the cafe with me for a minute, Sergeant? Thanks, Will. I was going in to say hello to some of the boys anyway. Fine. It's been a long time since I've been in here myself. I'm afraid you'll have a lot of questions to answer. Most of your customers are in here. Well, I'll have to answer them sooner or later anyway.
Late that night, as Sergeant Preston walked down Blackhawk's only street, he heard quick footsteps behind him. In a hurry, Sergeant? Oh, hello, Sam. No, I was just thinking. I didn't see you leave the cafe. Pretty noisy in there, wasn't it? Yes, the men will keep Iverson talking for another hour, I guess. He's a fine man. Yes, yes, he is. Sam, I've been wanting to ask you a few questions. Go ahead. Do you know if Jed Harrow spends much time at the cafe? Well, now that you mention it, it seems to me he does. He and Dan are together a lot. I see. They play cards a lot. In fact, they often ask me to join them in a game. <laughs> but the stakes are too high for me. Hmm. Just one more question, Sam. Hmm, if I can answer it. How many shots were fired when those men broke into Harrow's office? One. Are you sure of that? I swear to it. And that bullet was in the floor. What'd you say? Uh, just thinking out loud. Who fixed Harrow's arm? Dan did, I guess. And they sent me out to fetch help. Why? It's only a hunch, but it's worth a try. Where's Jet now? Down at the bank. In his office? Yeah. Well, in that case, King and I will retrace our steps. Thanks, Sam. Thanks? What for? I ain't done anything for him. What do you suppose it... We'll go calling on Jed, King. But I have a feeling we won't be very welcome visitors. <laughs> A single light burned in the bank in Jed Harrow's office, outlining the figures of three men, all of them gathered around the banker's desk. So that takes care of everything. You've uh, got your cuts. No need for us to ever see each other again. Still the banker, eh, boss? Without the banker, you boys never could have pulled this job. Well, that's all. Hey. I think I saw Preston looking through the window. Preston? Yes, we better get out of here. No, no, he's already seen you. If he comes in, remember, you've come to see me about a loan to work your minds. Well, well, this is a surprise, Sergeant. Yes, I imagine it is, Jed. I saw your light and thought I'd stop. Oh, if you're busy. Busy? Oh, no, no, no. These men were just leaving. <laughs> Sorry I couldn't let you have the loan for that mine, boys. We'll stop by in a week or two. Ain't working without the cash. You're Pete LeBeau, aren't you? Yeah. I didn't know you'd gone in for mining. I ain't it. I mean, not that anyone knows. I, uh, we're keeping the claim a secret. Uh, yes, well, uh, now uh, maybe if you... Jed, how's that arm of yours? Give you much trouble? No. Oh, I was lucky. Just a scratch. <laughs> Dan here got the bullet out before any damage was done. So you fill in as a sawbone as well as a bank clerk, huh, Dan? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's mighty handy being able to do two or three things. Our king here can smell a bullet wound a mile away. Can't you, boy? What's he barking for? Probably just because he wants to look at your arm. Don't you, king? Dogs make me nervous, Preston. Just keep him away from Oh, king won't hurt you, Jed. He's just friendly. <laughs> he doesn't look friendly. <laughs> If he comes any closer... He's got his teeth bared. Look out, Jed. Tell him to stop. I'll stop him. I'll brain him with this chair. Your arm, Jed. I thought you couldn't use it. Down, King. Uh, why didn't you say that before? Are you let... What's your game, Sergeant? Just this. When I saw a bullet in the floor there, I wondered why you faked that wound. Oh. Uh -huh. You hear that, boys? Sergeant here saw something we missed. Something you missed. Too bad for you, Monty. That dog of yours is good as signed your death warrant. You better put that gun away, Dan. Not before I use it. You daft. You can't kill a Mountie. Who says I can't? What do you think, boss? I think he knows too much. So that's the way it is, huh? These are the men who robbed the bank, and you led them into it. Yeah, much good it'll do you to know. You won't get away with this. <laughs> that's where you're wrong. I've gotten away with it this far. You're not stopping me now. You won't take a chance shooting him here, Dan. Out by the lake will be better. Then we. You're can... not going out to the lake or anywhere else, Harrow. Get that gun, King. Watch that door. Look out, Jed. All right, King. Down, no. fella. I'll door. reach all of you. Higher. This was all a mistake. I can explain. The only mistake you made, Jed, was when you had that arm tied up. Right now, the only place you're going is jail. Yes, King. The case is closed.
Challenge of the Yukon, the copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, brought to you every Saturday at this time, originated in the transcription studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bill Morgan speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. On King! On you husky! King, the swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston. As he meets the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region, and the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. <laughs> The wind was cold and biting as Sergeant Preston pulled up in front of a small, square building in Ogden City. Ho, King! Ho, you Huskies! Hi there, Sergeant Preston! Jack! How are you? Hi! Oh, it sure is good to see you. You gonna be here long? Oh, long enough to look around. Then King and I will be off again. Are you just coming in, or are you leaving? Well, me? Oh, I'm staying in town now. At least I will be for the next couple of days. Why... I guess you didn't hear. Hear what? Mr. Fodley. He died last week. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Jack. For the last time I saw him, I thought he had a chance to pull through. Yeah, I figured the same way. But it wasn't in the cards, I reckon. Dr. Atkins did all he could for him, but it didn't do much good. <laughs> the cave-in's a funny thing. You can't tell how much damage is... It's done inside a man. Mm. I plan to stop by the cabin in a day or so. Well, I suppose that leaves you in charge of things now. Yes. Oh, I won't be in town long. I'm planning to get back to the cabin in about three days. But I sure am glad I bumped into you. <laughs> How's King, huh? What's wrong with him? I never saw him act like that. I don't know. It... Mm. Say, it's those people coming this way. It couldn't be. King... <laughs> King, down, down, King. Dogs don't usually like me, but I never had one go for me like that. Oh, he must be mad. I'm sure he'd have jumped on you if that man That's your dog? Well, no. I... Dog is mine. And I assure you, he's never done a thing like this before. I'm sorry it happened. Yeah, so am I. He sure is a powerful looking animal. Next time I see him, I'm going to be carrying a gun. King's never out of my sight, Mr. Uh... Coleman. Well, I'm sure it won't happen again. Quiet, King. Sergeant, I'll be shoving along. I guess I'll see you again before you leave. All right, Jack. Uh, just a minute. You're Jack Travers, aren't you? Yes. Uh, we... We were just coming to see you, Mr. Travers. See me? You're strangers in these parts, aren't you? You might say so, yes. As a matter of fact, I'm glad there's an officer of the law here. What? Well, what's wrong? Uh, nothing's wrong, exactly. It's just that I have some news for you that might not be very welcome. You see, my client here, Miss Stone, is Abe Fodley's only surviving relative. Relative? I didn't know he had any living relative. And this will I have shows that Mr. Fodley left his mind and all his possessions to Miss Stone. May I see the will, Mr. Coleman? Yes, certainly. Mm hmm. Ooh, this is kind of a surprise. I didn't hear him say anything about any will. I knew you'd be disappointed, Mr. Travers. But you see, that's the way he wanted it. A secret. Mr. Travers, I... Well, there isn't much to say, really. You stood by my uncle, I understand, when he was all alone and needed help. I... I appreciate it. And you needn't oh, think Oh, that's that... all right, ma'am. He was mighty good to me, and I thought an awful lot of him. <laughs> well... I guess there's nothing much to do but wish you luck with the Mary Jane mine. I'll say this much. You got the richest stake in the Yukon. Oh, but I won't let you go off with 
With nothing, Mr. Travers. I told Mr. Coleman to set you up with a grub stick. Yes, uh, you'll be taken care of, son, even if the old man didn't mention you in the will. I'm not looking for any charity. Now, wait a minute, Jack. Don't feel that way about it. I think you should accept Miss Stone's offer. After all, it's a gesture of appreciation. Yes, that's the way I meant it. I wasn't thinking of charity at all. I don't... If you say so, Sergeant. I do. I think it would be a good thing for you. Well, thank you, ma'am. I'll take you up on your offer, then. Fine. Glad you feel that way about it. Now we'll be on our way. We have to stop at the courthouse with the will. Goodbye, Sergeant. And don't forget, Mr. Travers, I meant what I said about that steak. Goodbye, ma'am. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Paul. Jack, I suppose you're disappointed. Well, who knows? Maybe I'll bump into another streak of luck with this grub steak. <laughs> Where are you heading for? I was just going in the Washoe Cafe here. It's been a long time since I've seen Red and Pete. Oh, I might as well go in with you, if you don't mind. Oh, not at all. <laughs> mm, sure is crowded. Mm -hmm. Red's probably very happy. Business is good. Oh, there he is. Let's go over. Oh, Red. Hello there. Why, sir, you impressed me, sir. We can breathe. How are you? Fine, fine, Red. No need to ask how you are. I've been pretty busy these last couple of days. Hi there, Jack. Hello, Red. Well, what are you going to have? I just came by to talk for a few minutes, Red. <laughs> I don't know, but to offer you anything stronger than a cup of tea by this time, I said. <laughs> How about you, Jack? Oh, no, 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 thanks. I'm not celebrating today, Red. No? Oh, well, you should have been in here last night, my boy. The whole house was celebrating the best joke we've seen in a long time. What was that? Well, I don't know if you've met this Coleman fellow yet here in town. Yes, we met him this afternoon. <laughs> the last night, there wasn't a sour face in the place, like I said. Unless it was Coleman himself. Well, tell us what happened, Red. Well, if you've met him, chances are you've uh, already noticed the head of hair he's got. Well, I can't say I paid much attention to it, except that he has a lot of it. <laughs> That's the way it looked to everybody till the arguments started. <laughs> you see, uh, Jeff O'Shaughnessy and Mike O'Hare was having some words over in the corner, like they do when they're playing cards, you know. Before you know it, the whole place was in an uproar. Somehow, Coleman got mixed up in it. He was standing up beside the bar right where you were standing now. Glory be in the scuffle if a hair didn't come right off his head. A wig it is. He's as bald as a cue ball. <laughs> yeah, when the boys saw that, they got to laughing so hard they forgot what they were fighting about. <laughs> hey, that is kind of funny. You were uh, you were saying he was wearing a wig. True, as I'm standing here, ask any of the boys. Well, when we were talking to him, I just... What's wrong, Sergeant? Well, nothing, nothing. I'm just trying to imagine what he'd look like without that wig. And the mustache he's wearing. What are you talking about? I've seen that man somewhere before, Jack. Right now, I'm trying to place him. Later that day, as Ben Coleman walked down Main Street with the short, uneven step of one who's never grown used to walking in the snow, he heard footsteps coming up behind him. Hello, Mr. Coleman. Looks like we meet again. Yes, it does. I see your dog's a bit more quiet this time. You know, dogs don't often jump on men. Why, you seldom hear them. Yeah, is that so? Why, well, I remember in Boulder City seven years ago, one of the meanest-looking Malamutes you ever saw nearly killed a man. Hmm. In Boulder City? That's right. I saw it myself. So that's it, huh? Boulder City, seven years ago. I begin to remember now. It was in Boulder City that a bald-headed man kicked you, King. A confidence man who disappeared suddenly. Doc Perkins looked up from the open book on the table in front of him as his sharp ears caught the sound of approaching dogs. Visitors were rare. He listened a moment. Strange. Glory be. Hoking. How are you, husband? Sergeant Preston, is anything wrong? Yes. Yes, Doc, there is. Well, come inside, man, and rest yourself. Only for a minute, Doc. Well, 
How far have you come? Can I get anything for you? Are you hurt? No, or... no thanks, and I'm not hurt. King and I left Dogan City about noon, and I've come to ask you to go back with me. Well, I don't, I don't know what this is all about, but whatever you say is all right with me. Uh, I'll get my Mackin off. I, I guess you heard about poor old Abe Podley. Yes, I was talking to Jack. It's too bad. <laughs> These cave-ins. Uh, once a man's pinned beneath rocks the size we pulled off of him, uh, you can expect anything. Yeah. Uh, I'm ready whenever you are, Sergeant. Good, we have no time to waste. I'll explain to you as we arrive. Get the dogs up, King. On, King! On, you husky! The great dog, King, led the Mounties' pack on and on, back over the trails to Ogden City. In the small settlement... The clock in the courtroom showed 12 noon, the hour to probate the last will and testament of Abraham Fodley. Jack Travers had slipped to the back of the room, drawn by curiosity and a nameless loyalty to the old man he'd befriended. The circuit judge looked at the woman named in the will as the niece of the deceased. I guess you know the Mary Jane's one of the richest mines in the North. Yes, sir. I'd heard Uncle Abe had a fine claim. And you, you say he asked you to draw up this will. That's right. A short time before the accident, I stopped in to see him and drew up the will. I told him I'd stop back later for him to sign it. That's how it happened to be in your keeping. Yes. Well, I see no reason why this will... Just a minute, Judge. Sergeant Preston, what is it? I believe you're about to accept the will Mr. Coleman has presented on behalf of Miss Stone. You believe rightly, sir. I'd like to ask Mr. Coleman a few questions. I don't see what this man has to do with the will. If the sergeant has any questions about the will, they better be settled now. Go ahead. Mr. Coleman, did Abe Fodley sign this will himself? Yes, he did. That's Mr. Fodley's signature, as you can see. You witnessed him signing the will? I did. But I don't uh, see what judge. you... Judge, what's the date on that will? The 17th of January. Did he sign the will on the 17th of January? Yes, he did. Now, if that's all, I I'd like to... all, Mr. Coleman. Judge, there was a cave-in at the Mary Jane Mine on the 12th. In that cave-in, Abe's hands were so badly crushed he couldn't even hold a glass of water much less a pen. For five days before the 17th of January, and until his death four days later, it would have been impossible for him to sign anything. That's a lie. Jack Travers can tell you, Judge, that Doc Perkins took care of Abe after the cave-in. The Doc is right here now, and he can tell you that what I've said is true. That's right, Judge. Abe's hands were in such bad shape that even if he'd lived, he never could have held a pick again. I had both of them so bandaged up, and uh, then it didn't do much good. He couldn't use his fingers anyway. You have anything to say, Mr. Coleman? You'd better say it now. Before he starts saying anything, he might as well think of an explanation for the disappearance of Benjamin Cole, confidence man in Boulder City seven years ago. He wasn't seen again till he turned up in Ogden City as Ben Coleman. No. No, that isn't true. I didn't know anything about this. He came to me with the story of the mine and said if I'd turn it over to him, he'd take care of it for me. He would have taken care of it all right, Miss Stone, but for himself... You're under arrest for fraud and forgery, Coleman. And as for the mine, it's up to the court to decide about that. Well, since everyone in town knows young Travers worked the mine right along with Abe Fodley, the court turns the mine over to him. Come on, Coleman. This is one scrape you won't get out of. When King growled at you, I knew he had a reason. But I couldn't figure out what it was till I heard about that wig of yours. Then Boulder City and Benjamin Cole. They all tied up. I remembered Abe's hands. When I first saw the will, I didn't think of them. It did seem strange Abe would sign away the mine so soon before his death. When all these other things added up, and King remembering you as he did, I knew there was something wrong. You'll have a long time to think it over. In jail. Yes, King, the case is closed. Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, brought to you every Saturday at this time, originated in the transcription studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bill Morgan speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon.
King, the swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region, and the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in maintaining the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. In the light of the moon, the front of the bank at Dobie City seemed quiet and empty. But in the small office at the back of the building, voices were raised in argument. Sitting back in his chair behind a huge desk, the banker, Mac McDermott, watched the man facing him coolly. You better keep a civil tongue in your head, Sam. I got a tongue in my head, all right, and I aim to use it. I ain't seeing any more. He looks mighty determined to me. If what he says is true, if you're keeping more than half of the gold, Mac... What if it is true? Who does the thinking for this outfit? Not any of you. You better start thinking, then. Because if he gets to the Mountie, it'll be jail for all of us. There's no reason why he should get to anybody. If you see what I mean. Try and stop him. He's mad, hopping mad. If it means going to jail himself, I'd lay money down. He'd go through with it just to make sure you get there. And you two are so handy with your guns. You stopped those prospectors, didn't you? How? You mean we should... Yes. And now, before he meets anyone who'll listen to him. As the banker here, I can't take any chances. But nobody will suspect you two. Well, I always say when there's work to be done, no use putting it off. Glad there's one man of action around here, at least. Come on, Slim. I'm ready. You don't have to worry none about Sam. He ain't likely to meet anyone he can talk to. Just make sure of that. I see now. These must be his tracks here. I guess he went this way. wonder if he got on his sled. No, I don't think so. If I was in his shoes, I'd stay right here. I hate to do this, Pete. Yeah, it's him or us, and I never did like jails. Look. Huh? There he is. Yeah. He's just walking around. Well, he ain't going to be walking long. Got your gun? Yeah. Then let him have it and beat it quick. Now tell him who'll hear the shot and come running. Riding into Dobie City late that night, Sergeant Preston glanced about the darkened settlement. Hey, we'll have to go pounding on town marshal's door, I guess, King. Unless we make camp on the corner of Main Street. Hmm, it's quiet. Quiet and peaceful. What is it, King? Hmm? What's wrong, fella? Yeah, maybe we won't have to knock on Tom's door. He'll hear us coming. King. He's turning off to the left. Ho, you huskies. Ho, ho. All right, now. What is it, eh? At this hour of the night, there can't be... But there's someone in the snow. He... He's trying to move. What? What's wrong? Who... Sam. Sam Carson. Is it? Preston. Sergeant Preston. Yes. Now that's a bad wound. We'll have to no, fix it. No, no. It ain't no use. I'm done for. How did it happen, Sam? Who did it tell me? He didn't. I should have known. Who, Sam? Who? The, the, the... Dead. If only we'd found him sooner. So that's what you wanted me to see, King. But what was he going to tell me? He started to name the man who shot him. The next morning, miners and trappers crowded the streets and stores of the small settlement. Even at that early hour, the cafe was crowded. Bangs Murdoch often remarked his business began with the rising sun and his doors remained open as long as there were men at the bar. <laughs> Sergeant Preston's eyes skimmed over the crowd till he saw Bangs at the far end of the room pouring drinks. Mike, you know, 
dog on? Well, I can beat you at poker any day in the year, even with my eyes closed. Why in tarnation ain't you ready to put down the cash and back up your boast? Because I swore off gambling to please a... Sergeant Preston. Hey, when would you get in? Hello, Bangs. Hello, Mike. If I'd known you was coming, I... what do you have? It's on the house. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> it's kind of hard to offer the sergeant any hospitality in a cafe, ain't it? In my case, just trying to start up a game of cards, Sergeant. Ah, if I hadn't made that promise to you not to gamble anymore, I'd be a richer man right now. Yeah, or a poorer one. Bangs, I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes. Me? Sure. If it's private, we can go back here. I'll see you later, Mike. Sure. <laughs> Nobody bother us in here. What have you got on your mind, Sergeant? Sit down and make yourself comfortable. Whatever it is, you sure look sour enough about it. What's wrong? Bangs, where were you last night? Well, I was here. Like I always am. Till what time? About two o'clock, I guess. Then where'd you go? Home. Well, Shorty McCloud and me went over to the hotel. Talked for about an hour and I went to bed. Look here, Sergeant. You're leading up to something. What is it? Yes, I am leading up to something, Bangs. Sam Carson was murdered last night. Sam? Well, I'll be... Where? Near Olson's place. King and I were riding in. King found him. Must have happened pretty... Hey, now, wait a minute, Sergeant. You don't think that... That's why I'm here. What do you mean, that's why you're here? I didn't even see him last night. Well, you see, he was pretty far gone when we found him. Too far gone to be able to save. I asked him who shot him. He tried to answer me. They got this much out. Bam. Then he died before he finished it. Bam? Yes. You'll admit your name isn't a common one. Oh, it's a nickname. Everybody calls me Bam. Well, that's just the point. But I can prove it. I can prove where I was. Sergeant, I might have gambled a lot. I admit I ain't stayed to any straight and narrow path, but ever since I gave you my word that it was all over, I ain't turned a card. You've got to believe me. I want to believe you. And I certainly hope you can prove where you were. But look at it this way. Why would I want to kill Sam? He never did nothing to me. He spent a lot of time in the cafe gambling, didn't he? Yes. That ain't reason to kill him, is it? Bam. Three letters. B-A-M. Not a name beginning that way in the Yukon. Except mine. Except yours. Bernard Randall, Bronson Moore. Even those two names are unusual. I came to Dobie City on a slim clue, Bangs. For two months, I've been trying to find who's in back of the gold robberies and murders in these parts. You bump right into another one, eh? Uh, Banker Max says if the robberies don't stop... They'll ruin the bank. Yes. Most of the prospectors were on their way to the bank when they were robbed. It's getting so the miners won't bank. Bank. Banker Mac McDermott. I wonder. What's eating you now, Sergeant? No one knows about Sam yet except Tom Marshall and you. Any reason for keeping it quiet? I wanted to talk to you about it first. But if word were to get around that Sam didn't die... But you said he did die. He did. This room, Bangs. Where does that door lead to? Outside. Why? Does anyone use it beside yourself? No, never. Well, lock it up. Keep everyone else out. Yeah, sure. I still don't see... You will. You... Now, Bangs, listen closely. Here's what I want you to do if you will. Go over to the... In his office at the bank, Mac McDermott hurriedly called a meeting with the two men who'd been with him the night before. As soon as Pete returned with his companion, the banker accused them hotly. You could have taken time, to be sure. Yeah, I guess we should have stood there holding the gun on him till morning. Mm. Who shot him? I did. Once? Once. He dropped right where he stood, boss. I could have swore Slim got him. Well, he didn't. If it hadn't been for that Mountie. Now, listen to me. And if you've got a brain between you, maybe you can remember what I say. He's over in the back room at the Silver Dollar Cafe. Murdoch's taking care of him. He hasn't gained consciousness yet. And it's up to us to see that he doesn't. Yeah, but listen, boss. That back room over at the Silver Dollar is different from letting him have it on the street. There are windows in the room, aren't there? And there's a door. Meet me here tonight, after dark. And just to be sure there's no slip, this time I'm going with you. That 
that night, the two men met the banker, and together they set out for the Silver Dollar Cafe. They were sure the raucous laughter and loud voices in the front of the cafe would cover any noise they might make. Streets were deserted, and darkness covered them. There's the cafe ahead. Back of it's all dark. That'll make it easier. First, we'll try the door. If nobody's with him. I ain't hangering to bump into bangs or the naughty. If anyone's with him, we'll get him through the window. And them, too. Remember, if he opens his mouth, the two of you are as good as dead. And you, too, remember that. Quiet now. Whose dog's that? Uh, don't worry about any mutt. He probably is a stray Malamute. Now, wait till I go over to the window. Ah, uh, cuss that mutt. Shut up. Who'll pay any attention to a dog barking? It'll be the last time he barks it. That's funny. I could swear I've seen that critter somewhere before. You're just nervous. Yeah, look. There's no one in there with Sam. Yeah. He's on the couch over near the wall. Come on, let's go in and get this over with. Say, it's unlocked. Come on. Shall I turn up the lamp? He's sleeping. What are you turning up for, you fool? You had less light to see in last night and you missed him. This guy makes sure. <laughs> You'll never know what hit him. Come on now, get out of here. Mix with the crowd out in front. Not so fast, McDermott. What in the impression? I thought I recognized that mutt. You sure did a good job of warning us that a pack of skunks was coming. So you came back to finish the job, did you, Mac? You ain't so smart after all, Marty. Put up your hands. You better put that gun away, Slim. <laughs> Should I let him have it, boss? Well... For a minute, I was so surprised, I forgot you boys were holding guns. <laughs> no. No, don't let him have it here. You wouldn't dare to kill a Monty Mac, and you know it. It's suicide. Not for me, it isn't. Because there won't be anyone around to tell about it. I've been wanting to see the sergeant here in a spot like this for a long time. I always thought as much. Every time I looked into those greedy, murderous eyes of yours. I guess the same thing will happen to us that happened to Taylor. Abner Keller. All the rest of the prospectors on their way to your bank. As a matter of fact, you're right. That's exactly what's going to happen. All right, now get moving. Hey, Sergeant, ain't Shut you... Shut up. Just keep going. You heard him. What about Sam? Well, <laughs> somebody will find him in a couple of hours. This time, his mouth is shut for good. Well... Empty-handed, the Mountie don't look so brave, does he? You're forgetting something, Mac. My partner. Look out for that mud slim. Hold the gun on me, will you? No! Let go of my arm! Help! You got the gun, Sergeant? Yes, yes, I've got it. Stop it, Dermot! You won't take me! Not great, King! You'll get him. I never saw a dog like that in all my life. Where's... Oh, Pete here got caught by a haymaker he wasn't expecting. Nice work, Bangs. Oh! Oh! Well, McDermott didn't get far. When he finds out there was firing at a blanket roll. A blanket roll? That's right, Slim. You did kill Sam the other night. Bang circulated the story that he'd only been wounded. You believed it. This one's coming too, Sergeant. On your feet. Come on. Start moving, Slim. You too, Pete. We'll see how King's making out with his partner. Stay away from me. You hear? Good work, King. All right, get in line, McDermott. This parade is headed straight for the jail. Yes, King, thanks to you, another case is closed. Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon, Incorporated, brought to you every Saturday at this time, originated in the transcription studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bill Morgan speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network. The Challenge of the Yukon. On King, on you huskies! <laughs> King, the swiftest, strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the Yukon during the gold rush of 98. That was the year that brought over 50,000 men swarming into the Klondike region. 
and the greed for gold led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, the force preserved a splendid record in preserving the right. The challenge of the North was answered, and justice ruled triumphant. It was early morning, and in Will Conover's small cabin, two men faced each other. Will, quiet and determined. Cass Fenton, deadly calm. It was this very calmness, the cold cunning in Fenton's eyes, that meant death for the man across from him. No use reaching for that gun, Will. Why, you... Oh. Just a little bit too late. If you'd have reached sooner, you might have saved your gold. But I didn't plan it that way. Now to get the dust. Murder. But nobody will know Cass Fenton's behind it. A careful search revealed the precious dust hidden under a board in the floor. Pocketing it, Cass left the cabin and drove his sled back to town, where he kept a general store, stocking the provisions and equipment needed by the miners and trappers who came to Aberdeen for supplies. He left his sled outside the store as he opened the door. Hi there, Cash. What's the idea of the sled? Oh, hello, Mart. Close the door, will you? Yeah, sure. Going somewhere? You have time to sell me some flour. Sure. Sell you anything you need. Flour all you want? Uh-huh. Pretty well stocked up except for that. Yes, 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 yes. Hey, it seems you're laying out a lot of vittles. You heard me right, didn't you? Oh, these are for Will Conover. Oh, is he coming in? Oh, last time he was in, he asked me to bring him out some stuff in about two weeks. Got the date marked on the calendar so I wouldn't forget. Well, you ain't instituting a delivery service, are you, Cash? You, you bet I'm not. If I do that, I couldn't take care of the store. You know, I never could figure out just why you went in for selling supplies to men out there panning dust when you could go out with a pick and shovel yourself. This is a poor way to get rich, if you ask me. Oh, depends on how you look at it. Hey, if there ain't nothing wrong with Will, how come you're going out there? Well, he's been working that claim of his for a long time now. The last time he was in, he said he just hated to take a day off, even to come into town. Well, that's mighty nice of you. I just do it for special customers. Uh, Sergeant Preston, uh, why don't you get in town? I just came in this morning. How are you? Never been better. How's business, Cass? All my customers pay cash. That's something, Sergeant. Yes, indeed it is. <laughs> something for you? No, no, I just stopped by to say hello. I'm on my way over to Will Conover's. Conover? Well, that's where cash is going that's what I call a coincidence. Oh, you're going out to see Will? Oh, yes. I'm taking him some supplies. Oh, unusual, isn't it? I thought Will always came into town. Well, he always did, but right now he's so busy working his claims. I told Mart here, he just grudges the time it takes to come in from his place. Well, it shouldn't take him long. Will's not far from Aberdeen. Well, it's not that so much. But once he gets in, he meets the boys, and before you know it, they're over at the cafe. <laughs> I see what you mean. Day gone, just swapping stories, huh? Well, suppose you ride out with me, then. Ride out with you? Or better yet, I can take the supplies out to him. Oh, no, no, I'll, I'll go out with you. That'll fix it up fine. What's that? Oh, nothing. I'll be right with you. A short time later, on the trail toward Conover's cabin, Sergeant Preston urged the great dog king on. A light snow had begun to fall. On King! On you Husky! Yeah, this snow started without any warning. Yes. I suppose it'll keep up, too. Looks that way. Certainly covers tracks in a hurry. Well, that isn't always good, Cass. Yeah. I see what you mean. There's Will's cabin ahead. Uh-huh. Say, hey, that's funny. What? No smoke coming from the chimney. You're right. Maybe he didn't bother to light the fire. Might be working his claim. Still, you'd think he'd welcome the warmth of the cabin and keep the fire going. Ho, oh, King. Ho, oh, you huskies. Ho. Oh. Let me take some of these provisions. Well, here, I'll give you some help with it. Hey, look at King. He's walking up and down in front of the door. Leave the provisions in the sled, Cass. Yeah. I never doubt King's sixth sense. It looks like he feels there's something wrong here. <coughs> They're coming, boy. I wonder what it is. Seems as if he's just waiting to bound through that door. Well, we'll soon find out. Maybe we'd better go in. Yes. 
probably down by the creek. But... Will. I can tell from here. Is he... He dead? Yes. A gun in his hand. He didn't even have a chance to fire it. Uh, have a look at the gun. How long do you think he's been dead? No, I'd say about two hours, roughly. Yeah, none of these shells have been fired. Hmm. You're right, King, old fella. I've never known him to miss. He can sense death through closed doors, even before he's near enough to see it. Well, I guess there's nothing to do but tote those supplies back to town. Well, more important, find the murderer. Who'd want to murder Will? Unless... Unless? I don't know. Couldn't help thinking. Mark's been wanting to buy Will's claim. Never offered what it was worth, I guess. Anyway, Will wouldn't sell. Well, that's not a motive for murder. He didn't have any enemies. Of course, there are a couple of fellas in town that's owed him money... You looking for anything special, Sergeant? You never know what you'll find, Cass. Sometimes it's only a thread. But a murderer always makes one mistake. Yes? Yes. And that's what eventually hangs him. I sure don't see anything wrong. And uh, you? Uh, there's no no struggle. How do you make that out? Uh, no signs of it. Furniture would be overturned if there had been. Oh. Will obviously knew the man who came here. He knew him and they were talking. And yet he didn't completely trust his visitor. Hmm? Well, otherwise, he wouldn't have had the gun so handy. Uh, loosened floorboard. Where? Uh, that's funny. Uh, not so funny. This must have been where Will kept his gold. It's gone. So it was robbery. But who'd take Will's gold? Well, according to him, the ground by the creek's full of it. Questions, questions. Uh, and only the murderer has the answer. Sergeant Preston went over the cabin minutely with Cass Spenton close beside him. The storekeeper is silently gloating at his cleverness in pulling what seemed to be the perfect murder. A short time later, heading back to Aberdeen... Sergeant Preston was thoughtful and quiet. Cass, too, was lost in thought, smiling grimly, certain the Mountie had no way to uncover the killer. Oh, King, how are you, Husky? I'll take the supplies back into the store. You need any help? No, no thanks. I can manage. Yeah, I'll take this bag. I could have taken those, Sergeant. Here, I'll open the door. Huh? There. There. Now, just put them down the counter. That's fine. Nothing to do now but put him back in stock. Well, it was nice of you to take me out. Now, look, Cass. You say there's some men in town who owed Will money. There sure are. Well, it's possible, of course, that any one of them might have gone out to the cabin to borrow more. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. Will said no dice, and then... Uh-huh. Yes. Just a hunch. Sounds logical to me. Suppose you give me the names. Uh, you have them? Well, I can't say as I got all of them, but I can give you a pretty fair idea. Let's see, I don't know about Mark Davis. No, I don't think Mark ever borrowed from him. But old Snake Wiley did. And Pete. Chuck Shannon used to borrow from him regular. I know as true as I'm standing here, Will never saw any of that money again. Fine. That's Willie, Pete, and Chuck Shannon. Any more? No, that's about all. Well, suppose we meet here in the store in about an hour. I'd like to ask a few questions. Suits me, Sergeant. I aim to give you all the help I can. Believe me, I'm as anxious as you are to see that the killer gets what he deserves. Well, I hoped you'd feel that way about it. After he left Cass Fenton's store, Sergeant Preston went to the local cafe where he knew he'd find at least one of the three men who were indebted to Will. He was surprised to find all three of them gathered around the pot-bellied stove at the far end of the room. The three puzzled ne'er-do-wells agreed to see the Mountie in an hour and spent the time after he left them till they went to Fenton's, trying to guess what was afoot. Meanwhile, Sergeant Preston talked to King, the dog's intelligent eyes on his master's face. You understand, King? When I say the right one... You got it, that boy. Ah, good. You're going to catch the killer.
The hour passed quickly, and soon the three men, together with Cass Fenton, faced Sergeant Preston and King. Now, look here, Sergeant. I ain't done anything that calls for the law to... I didn't say you had, Pete. I brought you all together to try to find a murderer. Murderer? Hey, you got the wrong man. I don't know nothing about any murder. Who's been killed? Now, keep quiet, fellas. Give the sergeant a chance to talk. None of you have to worry if you're innocent. But Will Conover was murdered sometime this morning. Will? Why, I'll kill the man that done it with my own hand. Easy now, Pete. How do you aim to find out? Well, a lot of people think I work alone. Well, I don't. King here is my right hand. And it's King who's going to help solve this murder. What do you mean? Well, you all know how accurate a dog's sense of smell is. Well, I have here the poke that contained Will's gold. The gold the murderer stole. King will get the scent from this. And then see which one of us... That's right. Well, what makes you think we had anything to do with it? Well, I'll explain that later. You ready, King? Now, here's the poke. There, I'll drop it on the floor. You better get over there with Pete, Cass. Me? Yes. You ready, King? Oh, wait a minute. I didn't have any... Go ahead, idea. fella. Well, he's not going to... Shut up. Now, yeah. he passed me up. Yeah. Where do we see? This is important, King. Smart dog. He knows I didn't have nothing to do with it. Yeah, I passed you right up. You want to be sure to get the right one? Hey, Cass. What's that mutt barking for? Are you sure, King? Cass, King stopped in front of you. That means one thing. I'll kill him. Get that gun. Go. All right. Now get over to the wall, all of you. Cass. Shut up. You too, Sergeant. Over to the wall. So King was right. You thought by going back to the cabin, finding the body, nobody would suspect. Yeah. I don't know how he figured, but he was right. After I finished the four of you off, I'll get that dog. Hey, now, wait a minute, wait. Cass. I should have let Preston have it back in the cabin. The only reason you didn't was because you thought I'd never be able to find you out. There's one bullet out of that gun, Cass. The bullet that's in Will Conover's heart. In one time, you're too smart for your own good, Molly. The police force will miss you. Oh, you're wrong, Cass. They won't miss me. Adam King! Oh, oh. That dog shot him down! Get the gun! You got it, Sergeant. Get away from me! Those teeth! All right, King. Oh. I never see nothing like King, Sergeant. First he finds a murderer, then he drops him. You're covered with your own gun, Cass. Put these handcuffs on him, Pete. I told you murderers always make one mistake. Well, you made yours when we went to that cabin. There was only one way you could have known Will didn't have a chance to fire his gun because you didn't look at it. In order to see whether he'd used it or not, I had to take it from his hand. And you mean King did It would have been impossible to catch a scent from that poke. King was going by words. And he did a good job. Yes, King, the case is closed. Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, brought to you every Saturday at this time, originated in the transcription studios of WXYZ Detroit. The characters and events in tonight's drama were fictitious. Bill Morgan speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network.